Good evening, and welcome to this meeting of the Merrimack School Board this Monday, September, or Tuesday, September 6, 2016. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Just one quick announcement. Um, Board Member Michael Thompson is actually with us by phone. We're going to be doing some steps to uh, comply with laws so that way we uh, can have him join and participate in the meeting. So Michael, can you hear me? I can. Thank you, Michael. And can everyone hear Michael? Thank you. Uh, Michael, can you please explain uh, where you are and who you might be with? Excellent. So thank you, Michael. Um, uh, on that, we will uh, resume the meeting. So item number two is public participation. If you'd like to speak, please come up to the microphone, state your name and address for the record. Seeing none, we will close public participation. And we're on to item number three, which is very exciting. We've been waiting all summer for this one, which is the introduction of our student representative to the school board. So I want to uh, welcome you, Zev, as our student representative. And if you could introduce yourself, we would love that. Um, hello, everybody. I'm really honored to be here for my first uh, meeting. Uh, my name is Zev Cernick. I'm a rising senior at Merrimack High School. and I'm very active in the school. Um, I'm the treasurer of the National Honor Society, as well as the captain of the math team and the quiz bowl team. Um, I additionally do Science Olympiad and many other organizations. And I'm really honored to have this opportunity to um, improve our community in any way I can. So thank you, guys, for that. And thank you and welcome, Zev. We hope it's going to be a great year for you. It's going to be a great senior year for you. Um, so we're on to item number four. And I will invite to the table Michael Wimsat from the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services to the mic. And uh, we will be talking about information that he has uh, that will be new to the board regarding PFOAs. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for the record, my name is Mike Wimsat. I serve as director of the Waste Management Division for the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Um, and I'm, I'm here today at the invitation of the board. Uh, Superintendent Chaffrey had uh, spoken with me and said that there were some questions that the board has had regarding the presence of PFOA in drinking water in the Merrimack Village District System. And I'm, I'm here mostly at your disposal to answer any questions you might have, but I, I do, I guess, by way of a few introductory remarks, I uh, want to let you know that, uh, and I think folks in Merrimack know this very well, that DES has been working really hard since March, or really late February, early March of this year, on uh, the Southern New Hampshire PFOA investigation. And as you may know, we have sampled well over 1,000 drinking water wells in uh, about a five-town area now at this point. Um, we have worked uh, very closely with the Merrimack Village District System on the detection of PFOA in their, in their supply wells. Uh, we've been uh, engaged with the responsible party, uh, uh, St. Gobain Performance Plastics, for, since right in the very beginning of this process. And we have requested that they do a number of things to address the presence of PFOA in drinking water in the area, including uh, in the Merrimack Village District source wells. And so as you, I'm sure you also know, Merrimack Village District wells four and five were taken offline because of the detections of PFOA in those wells. And we have requested that St. Cobain, um, first of all, fund uh, the design of a treatment system for those wells so that, they, so that the water from those wells can be treated and the wells can be brought back online. Uh, we have uh, also asked that once that design is completed that they agree to pay for uh, the actual construction and operation of that treatment system. Uh, the treatment system that would very likely, uh, while the design work is ongoing at this time, very likely that treatment system would be a large scale granulated activated carbon treatment system, which is a common and very well understood treatment method for drinking water. Um, what we understand right now from both experience and reading literature is that uh, granulated activated carbon works really well for treatment of PFCs, of PFOA, 
And uh, if that were to be designed and implemented, it's our expectation is that it would be very effective in removing the PFOA contamination from the, from the source wells in the Merrimack Village District system. Uh, the, unfortunately, the time for that is, is lengthy. It takes time to do the design and then would take time to construct and bring that system into operation. Or just maybe put I, it in direction for the I think generally it's the, my, the speakers are aimed out that way. So it's even hard for us to, to hear, at least for me anyway, oh. to hear clearly too because of the way. So I don't know if there's anything we can do to help, but all the sound is going that way. Huh. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we, we're you. having trouble the same way. Right. Oh. I see. I, I'm happy to speak up. I don't know if that helps or not. Yeah, and I think the redirection of the uh, the speaker is also doing oh, wonders. <laughs> um, if you could just give us a test mic, uh, not you, Michael Thompson, you, Mike, our guest. <laughs> okay. Is this better? Can you hear me better now? How are you doing with that, Michael? That was a little better, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. I'll, I'll try to just speak louder, and if it gets too loud, just let me know. <laughs> great. No problem at all. Thank you. Um, so. Essentially, that's where we're working on the long-range plan here with respect to the Merrimack Village District System. I do want to emphasize that the Merrimack Village District System is a regulated public water supply. Uh, as, as such, they're required to provide uh, compliant drinking water to all of their customers, water that meets the established drinking water standards. And uh, as many of you know, New Hampshire DES regulates public water systems in the state. Um, and there are a number of contaminants that for which we have uh, established drinking water standards. We don't have an actual drinking water standard for PFOA right now. What we have is, is once, we, once we learned about this problem and, and, and looked at the information we had, EPA established a, what they called a, a uh, lifetime health advisory for PFOA and PFOS. And when they did that, we very quickly moved to make an emergency rule uh, under state law that would establish um, that, that the recommended advisory, which was 70 parts per trillion of PFOA or PFOS or any combination of the two, uh, as, uh, as an ambient groundwater quality standard, which means that uh, the effect of that is that if we find that concentration is exceeded in groundwater of the state, it gives the department the authority to require a couple of very important things. One is uh, investigation and remediation of that contamination. And second, to ensure that no provider of water provides drinking water over that level and that um, the responsible party for the contamination takes steps to ensure that um, parties who are impacted that, by that, whether they be private well owners or customers of a public water system, um, that they are provided with safe drinking water. So uh, currently, that, uh, that, that's an emergency rule that's in place at 70 parts per trillion. Uh, as is required by state law in order to make a rule like that permanent. It's only the emergency rule is effective for six months. We meet very shortly after the emergency rulemaking, we undertook a regular rulemaking, if you will, to establish that as the permanent ambient groundwater quality standard for PFOA and PFOS. And that uh, process has been ongoing. We have had a public comment period, which ended around the third week of August. We are reviewing the public comments that we receive from that during that during that period, and then we will uh, address those and move to permanent rulemaking or final. We will file um, a final proposal with the Joint Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules, which is our process, um, probably in uh, late September, uh, with the idea that it would become a permanent standard before the end of the year. Uh, so that's I, I guess I just wanted to say kind of as background, and then from there, I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Are there any questions from the members at the table? And Michael, I'll call on you, um, call on you directly for anything as well. Naomi? I think that, thank you very much for being here. I think that this is a question that um, will also perhaps reflect Michael's from afar. I know that at the last meeting, we talked about the changes that have happened over time with the um, limits placed on PFOAs lowering themselves from 120 to 70 and so forth. And mm -hmm. I'm curious whether you see that as a trend that will continue, and if so, how it might be addressed usefully. 
Sure. Thanks for the question. It's, it's hard to say. Um, I will tell you that we uh, adopted the 70 part per trillion or we proposed that as a rule uh, based on direct, the direct recommendation of EPA. And EPA had a multi-year study in review of the literature, all the available literature, both in terms of animal studies as well as human studies, um, in order to come up with that, with that level. Our health risk assessors have reviewed that in detail and their recommendation to us was that it was protective and that it met our standards. It's also the case that under state law, if EPA establishes either a drinking water standard or a lifetime health advisory, which is the case here, at a certain level for a contaminant, our law directs us to adopt that as an ambient groundwater quality standard. So at some level, we're, we're actually following what the law tells us to do here. Having said that, if e, you know, EPA, we understand that EPA continues to do work on this. Uh, science continues to advance with respect to the understanding of these compounds, both from a chemical standpoint and a health effects standpoint. And uh, as, as more information becomes available, if um, the experts who review it recommend that a different number, whether it's higher or lower, should be the appropriate standard, then we would take that information into consideration. Um, and, and, and act on it. I, I, will, I will tell you that that's not a theoretical position. We do that fairly routinely. We have about, geez, I, I shouldn't throw out a number, but probably on the order of 60 or 70 contaminants that we regulate, that we have established ambient groundwater quality standards for. But of course, and we've had those for, for many of them for many years, but science marches on and information marches on. and. Uh, Periodically, we update those ambient groundwater quality standards. In some cases, they go down because new research suggests that, that a compound is more toxic or has some other health endpoint that wasn't understood before. And in other cases, they actually go up because the available data that becomes available, or the data that becomes available about the compound is more complete and they get a better picture of its actual health effects and the recommendations from the experts at the national level is to increase that number. So we've done both of those things, but we, it's not a static, you know, the rulemaking is not a permanent, okay, that's the, that's the standard, it'll be that way forever. It's something we continue to review and, and we modify as necessary. Thank you very much. Welcome. Cinda? Um, I have a couple questions. One is kind of I guess I would call it like more of a range type of a question. So we've tested our water a couple of times, which is a snapshot in time, right. you know, where we've gone to the various schools and, and gotten our levels. So what I'm, what I'm wondering is if there's, you know, you could take it two days later, who knows, right. maybe after a big rainstorm, maybe that level goes up, maybe it doesn't. Right. Is there any kind of a range, like when you get a certain number that, you know, might be reflective of what might actually exist other than on either side outside of that snapshot? Does that make sense? Well, sure. I, I think I understand your question. I, it, it's hard to give a specific range. What we do know from, you know, understand that DES regulates uh, water systems all over the state, several hundred water systems. Some of them, you know, fairly large systems like, like MBD system or even larger like Manchester system and some very small to a point of it's a, you know, a coffee shop or something that serves enough customers that they're regulated. So we have a lot of experience reviewing groundwater data um, and required testing of, of, of drinking water. And what we generally find is that, particularly for a bigger system that's pumping at high rates, day-to-day um, -day or, you know, even week-to-week -week or month-to-month -month fluctuations are not that great. Um, but having said that, we know that things can change and that's why there's a requirement for systems to test on a periodic basis. And in fact, the testing that's going on for MVD and that has gone on over the last several months has been even more frequent than, than, um, than usual, or than is generally required, because we've been very concerned. We want to make sure we understand if there are any trends there. So this MVD water system, you know, for, certainly for, from the standpoint of PFOA, is being monitored very, very closely, probably more closely than any other water systems in the state right now. Um, um, with that, can you tell me a little bit about um, what kind of oversight is being done on Merrimack Village District or what type of reports that they have to comply with um, to the state sure. and um, if they've um, been succeeding at that and have been cooperative with all of the demands that have been placed on them. 
Is that something that you can speak about? Sure. I, and, and I would preface my remarks by saying that I, I serve as director of the Waste Division and, and, and our water systems are regulated by our Water Division. But having said that, um, we've all been, those of us who are working on this have been living it every single day and we are communicating regularly. We have uh, um, either a bi uh, twice a week or a weekly meeting on this with all the folks from the divisions who are working on this. So we're really, most of us are pretty up to date. I will tell you that the folks at MVD have been working very closely with our water division staff. Um, you know, they've gone on, uh, they've, they've sampled together on a pretty frequent basis. They, they're reporting the work that they do and the results that they get on pretty much a real-time basis with us. So we're, we're pretty much hand in glove right now in terms of uh, getting information. We, we pretty much get the information that MBD gets from its labs almost as quickly as they get it. So I have no discomfort with the level of communication and the information that we're getting from the MBD system. And I think my colleagues in the Water Division would, would echo that. Okay. Um, I know sitting at this table, we've received a variety of um, communications from citizens in Merrimack mm -hmm. um, and parents and even some staff. Um, if it were you living in Merrimack, how would you feel about the levels that you currently have? If you and your family were living in Merrimack, maybe you do. <laughs> sure. But, um, you know, t tell me how that would make you feel or what, what you might do okay. at your home or your schools, if anything. Sure. Well, well, nobody wants to learn that their water has anything in it that doesn't belong there. I mean, at the, at its, at the, at the heart of it, um, this is a synthetic compound that doesn't occur in nature. And the concentration in the groundwater, you know, under the perfect circumstances should be zero. The reality of the situation is, is it isn't. And, and even in places where we don't necessarily have an industrial source, we can detect PFOA in groundwater. We can detect it in soil. Um, it's a compound that's been manufactured uh, and synthesized since the 1940s. It's been in hundreds or thousands of commercial products, of retail products. You know, people have it in their homes. Um, so y you do have to put it in perspective. How would I feel? I, I, I want to hear that my water doesn't have any PFOA in it. I think that's what anybody would want to hear. Having said that, I will say that, um, you know, we. I'm pretty familiar with what goes into setting a standard, setting a drinking water standard. It is a very conservative process. Uh, the risk assessors take the best information they have available to them and they work it into various models of and they make certain very conservative assumptions about exposure, about how much water someone will drink, about you know, drinking that water over an entire lifetime. Um, and I know that, so because of what I know about that, you know, I, I, my, I, I truly believe that when drinking water standards are met, that the drinking water is safe to drink. And I also know enough about it to know that there are other hazards and, and contaminants that, we, that, that occur in, ground, in drinking water naturally. Um, you know, it would be great if arsenic was zero in drinking water, but in New Hampshire it usually isn't. And it's not because anybody disposed of arsenic improperly, it's because uh, the, the natural soils and the, and the parent rock who made our soils here has arsenic in it, so we find arsenic. It's the same with radon. So there are other hazards associated with drinking water that, um, you know, when you put it all in perspective, um, you know, anytime there's a contaminant that can pose a potential health risk, you want the number to be zero. But based on what I understand and when I look at what goes into setting the standards, if drinking water meets the standards that have been set, then I'm comfortable drinking it. And, and most of us do that. I mean, most of us, wherever we get our water, we drink water that has some contaminants in it, and we try to test it and we treat it if we need to to make sure that it meets the standards that have been set. And I guess just one final question. I probably know the answer. Um, the standards are set for safety, I'm assuming, for most people, all people. Is there anything that we should consider as it relates to how the PFOAs um, and the PFO, is it S's? What is it? PFOS, yeah. P PFOS's, how they affect children or any other precautions that should be taken um, specifically as it relates to children. Because yeah. these, are, these are the people that have longer lifespan ahead of Absolutely. them. Absolutely. They're yeah. also smaller and, and tiny, so I'm really curious to hear what you have to say if there's sure. anything about that. Well, I'm happy to answer that. I'll, I'll preface my remarks by saying I'm not a toxicologist, so yeah. I'm, 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 I'm sharing with you what I've learned as, as someone who's dealt with 
clean drinking water and contaminated sites for most of my career. I, I have a certain amount of knowledge about it, but I'm not, not a toxicologist, so I, I want to make that clear. I understand. I appreciate your insights, though. Thank you. What I understand about this, uh, the EPA's work to evaluate and set this lifetime health advisory at 70 parts per trillion is based on looking at, in the end, it's animal studies because the human studies, um, while they've taken that information into advi under advisement, they, they, all the experts who reviewed this in, in, in different places agreed that the quality of the human data available was not that high. There just wasn't enough definitive information to set the standard based on human data. So we do what we often do when we set standards. Um, we use animal data, animal studies that have been done. And so using that information, that the limited information associated with human studies and the more expansive information associated with animal studies, they looked at various health endpoints. And the, uh, the standard of 70 part per trillion is actually based upon what they do is they look at all the possible health endpoints and they look at the one that's the most sensitive receptor. What's the receptor? That's the person who, who's getting exposed. Who is the most delicate, the most sensitive to the smallest concentration. And when they did that, they identified either a pregnant woman or a nursing infant as the most sensitive receptor. So they set that 70 part per trillion. And so even though the 70 part per trillion is protective, for all the health endpoints over a lifetime, it's actually set based on a more short-term exposure of a pregnant mother or a nursing infant. And what, what the experts at EPA who set the advisory said was that at 70 parts per trillion, a, a pregnant mother or a nursing infant would not have an ha adverse health effect as long as the water that they were consuming, and they made very generous assumptions about how much water each, each of those, would, those receptors would, would, uh, would consume um, if, as long as the concentration was below 70 parts per trillion. So that's how it was set. Now there's other health effects that are associated with children and adults, not infants and, and pregnant mothers, um, that uh, also they have data for. But when they do the calculations for those, numbers that are higher would be protective. So the, 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 the conclusion they come to is that if our most sensitive receptor is this pregnant woman or a nursing infant and we set and 70 parts per trillion is protective for them, then anything, any other health endpoints for others, even including a lifetime of, of drinking, you know, two liters a day for a 70-year lifespan, um, is protective for that as well. So that, that's what I can tell you about how that was derived. Oh, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to thank you for your time and for coming out tonight. Um, we to really appreciate it. Okay. Andrew, do you have any questions? I do, but I want to defer to Michael because I think his may be on the same line. I have a slightly orthogonal okay. question. That's so. quite all right. I, I'll let you defer. Michael, do you have questions? Me? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> understand a little bit better uh, what information you can share. Um, to start off, I just want clarification. Uh, in your discussion or in your starting um, uh, introduction, you stated that there's state law that basically states that we have to, as a state, um, take the federal guidelines as the guidelines for the state. Is that, do you know if that's the RSA 485-C6? Is that the RSA that uh, actually pertains to that? Yes, I believe it is. Um, I didn't hear the answer. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, that is the that is the statute. You, you gave the right uh, citation. Appreciate that. And and within that and within that statement, um, it does say that where the standards actually have to be equivalent um, to exposure, which causes a lifetime exposure risk of one cancer in one million exposed population. Do you know if that's the guidelines that the, F, uh, the federal government uses to actually create those guidelines, or is there any other stuff that they take into consideration for the, uh, for the number that they provide? Sure. That, that's a terrific question. And again, I'm, I'm going to speak kind of loud here because I want to make sure you hear me, and hopefully I won't blast everyone here out. Um, if for those who didn't hear, the question was um, that the, the, the statutory requirement that I referenced earlier also says that if a standard is set based on cancer risk, that it be set at an excess cancer risk of one in one million. 
and that's absolutely correct. And the question was, yeah. is this standard of 70 parts per trillion, as I understood your question, based on a cancer risk? And the answer, is that the right question? Is that what you're answer, asking? Is that your question, Michael? Yeah, I, but that, I, I believe his question to me was whether that's the standard or the, I guess, the, the level used to decide the level for the 70 parts per trillion, the one, one, one million. Right. So, so the answer to your question is that the standard is not set based on a cancer risk. Um, my understanding, and I actually read this earlier today, so I, I, have, I have a pretty good grasp of it, is that the available data on potential cancer risks uh, was most complete for a testicular cancer endpoint. And so that's the data that was used to determine what levels would be protective for cancer risk. And in fact, um, it was determined that the receptor for that was not the most sensitive receptor. And if you did that, if you, if, when the toxicologists crunch the numbers, they find that the 70 parts per trillion is protective for, um, against an excess cancer risk of one in five million. So actually it's five times more protective than actually would be required if it were being, if the standard were based on a cancer risk. And now for people that don't work in risk assessment, I know that what I just said may be really hard to understand, but I'll explain a little bit so maybe it'll be helpful. If you're looking at a compound or a contaminant and you're concerned that, the, let's say if a, a, a theoretical contaminant where the only health risk is a cancer endpoint, someone's going to get cancer if they get exposed at a certain level. They look at the data that's available and when they set a standard for that particular contaminant, they set it at a level that is believed to um, have a risk of one excess cancer in one million people. So in other words, if a million people drank water at that level, two liters a day for 70 years, and they, um, that, that as a result, at, that it was contaminated at that level, there would be one cancer out of those one million people. That's what they call it an excess cancer because unfortunately cancer is prevalent in our society. So if you have a million people, a lot of those people are going to get cancer for other reasons. So they call it an excess cancer. In other words, a cancer that would be attributed to the exposure to the contaminant. So when they looked at the 70 part per trillion, which I explained earlier, is based upon um, the, the sensitive receptors of a, of a pregnant woman or a nursing infant, what they set it based on that, but when they look at that 70 parts per trillion in the context of its projected ability to cause an excess cancer, it's believed that it would potentially cause an excess cancer at the rate if 5 million people drank water at that level for a lifetime, there would be one excess cancer out of those 5 million people. So that's a long way of answering your question, saying it wasn't, bait, the number is not based on a cancer uh, risk. but that is factored in there and it's been determined that the 70 parts per trillion is adequately protected, more than adequately protective against cancer risk. Yeah, thank you. That actually, uh, that actually was going to, my follow-up question was what, what number was it at? So I do appreciate the uh, understanding of the 5 million. Um, as a follow-up question, is the level based off of any other uh, health factors outside of just cancer? And, and one of the ones that I've seen is uh, a challenge of, you know, it actually being effective to immunization in children. So mm -hmm. is that actually part of the factor of determining that level, or has that not been considered in the level that's actually provided by the federal government? No, my understanding is that for any health endpoints, I apologize, I'm trying to talk loud, but I don't want to, for any health endpoints that uh, are, are known to be a potential, uh, they were, all of the data that was available um, was factored into that. So they were looking at a variety of potential health endpoints, but the one that ended up being determinative was the, the, uh, the sensitive receptor endpoints for the uh, pregnant woman and the nursing infant. So that's a yes. And, and I'm, <laughs> I, I have not had a chance to look at the FDA report, but um, is it possible that you may be able to share the link to um, uh, this, our school board or uh, to
to Marge and so that the board can actually possibly review that to see if there's information in there that pertains to children and immunization or other factors? Oh, oh sure. I, all of those are public documents that were released at the time that the Lifetime Health Advisory was established back in May. So I'd be happy to provide a, a link to all that information to the, to the superintendent so that the board would have access to that. Appreciate that. I, I do have a follow-up um, question on just drinking water in general. Um, I know that uh, with this discussion, we've, and you actually even brought up arsenic as, a, as another uh, item that we may be wanting to look at or lead. Um, I did look on the NHES website regarding suggested water quality testing, but the only one that I found was for private wells. And it looks like the last time it was updated was 2011. Is there a newer guideline that's been provided by the NHDES for even, I'm not sure, public or private wells and what we should be testing for as, as a whole? Uh, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. I can certainly find out, um, you, know, it, you know, a good example would be um, if you're going to test a private well, you might want to look for PFOA, and I'm sure in 2011 when we wrote that, we w would not have said that. So um, I, I can yeah, find I out. Can, I can, I'll send you the link that I found, and, and uh, if you can share any updated information, that would be greatly appreciated. Sure, that would be great. Uh, yep. Do you have another question? Uh, I will defer to Andy at this point. Uh, I okay. think I've... Uh, Got my questions. Thank you. Thanks. Such protocol we're following here. <clears throat> I apologize, I'm losing my voice for some reason. Uh, so you you mentioned that you're part of the waste division right. in FIP. Now, I know that during the discussions around St. Cobain with the air contamination sinking into the soil, the other thing that's come up is a couple of areas of town where dumping has occurred over the years where there might also be contamination. Mm -hmm. In particular, the area by the current transfer station, which is a capped um, um, dump, essentially, a, a line dump, right? Unlined, okay. Um, and, but the other is the, the longer dumping sites, which are down close to the Merrimack River, which is where the dump used to be before it was out on Lawrence Road. Mm -hmm. And there's been talk about whether contamination to some of our district wells or private wells out near, because I live near the other station, has occurred. Because I know the DES sent actually a mailer to my house asking if I had a private well or not and whether it could be tested. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what's the DES doing around sort of landfill contamination that is resulting in some of our contaminations versus just St. Cobain? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, you mentioned the Merrimack landfill. We did go out and, and test uh, monitoring wells. The, because it's a closed online landfill, it has a network of groundwater monitoring wells around it. They're not used for drinking. Their, their purpose is to monitor the quality of the groundwater near the landfill. We did go out and sample those wells, and we did identify elevated concentrations of PFOA, and that raised concerns about the potential for nearby public or private drinking water wells to be impacted. So we also did a very robust and aggressive effort to sample a number of drinking water wells around the landfill. Um, happy to report that the only well, n none, of the, none of the private drinking water wells uh, showed elevated levels of PFOA. Um, we did uh, note that there was one uh, well at the transfer station itself that was impacted, and apparently that was a well that has been posted not for drinking for some time, so we don't believe that was a meaningful exposure pathway. Um, so, so that work has, you know, we, we, I think we're still filling in a few gaps. You know, we, as you say, we mail cards to people and we still have a few wells where, that are still yet to be sampled around the landfill, but the work we've done has been very in encouraging there. The second one you mentioned was the longer disposal site, and we did uh, early on uh, go out and sample from monitoring wells around that site, and uh, we did find elevated levels of PFOA. At this point, it's not clear to us that those levels necessarily represent um, impacts from the disposal facility or only impacts from the disposal facility, that there may be also just overall impacts in the large radius around the St. Cobain facility. There's some work that's going to be ongoing to help evaluate that, so we'll know more in the future. Um, those are the only two locations where we, that we identified around you know, with the, in a circle with the center being the St. Gobain facility. 
um, that, uh, that we thought needed to be evaluated. You, you may know that we also looked at the Sauhegan landfill um, in Amherst, um, and we've looked at a, a landfill in Salem. So we have looked further afield at other, other source locations, um, but uh, that's basically the extent of what we've done by way of disposal sites at this point. Okay, thanks. So, Michael, I'm done with what I yeah, had. I'm going to just jump in for one question, and then I will throw it back to you, Michael. And just for the sake of disclosure, I am on that road with the landfill, and you did test my well, and it did come out quite clean. So oh, I'm glad you're to great hear to that. work with, and if you want to let your colleagues know, we appreciate your your it's efforts. Well. Um, you're very professional and, and very quick to get our results back. Um, so that being said, the only question that came up at our last meeting that um, I'm not sure had clarity or we I think there's always debate, but that you might have noticed we're in a bit of a drought right now and <laughs> <laughs> just might have noticed. Yes. Um, but uh, the, the discussion is lack of rain is actually impacting and lowering the PFOA numbers because um, it's not saturating in the ground from what's been released into the air. So what do you see, and of course it's not scientifically uh, legally binding your answer, but um, <laughs> what do you see as if we have a steady and healthy rainfall, what do you see happening to the PFOA levels because of it? Uh, you know, you raise a fair question. Um, you know, we know that if, if you look at the, in our business, we, we talk about how something got in the ground and, and how it's traveling. We call that our conceptual model of what's happening. So the conceptual model for this site is that PFOA was in the air emissions associated with the St. Cobain facility. Um, it drifted on the winds and dropped out over a large area, and that's why we see it in a 360-degree in radius. We see it in a circle. You know, normally when the, the sort of more classic way that we deal, you know, in our work, almost every site we deal with is where somebody disposed of something into the ground. It got into the formation, got into the groundwater, and then it travels at the direction and, and, or more or less at the speed or a little less than the speed of the groundwater flow. And so that's how, that's our normal conceptual model. Well, we had to throw that out for this one. That's why it's pretty new for us. We don't have very many sites at all where we see airborne deposition causing a groundwater problem, but we certainly, we're, we're confident that that's what's happened here. So we're looking at that. So there's still a lot we're learning, and we had to really uh, prioritize the order of our work, and it was an easy decision. We had to go out and sample as many private drinking water wells and public drinking water wells as possible, as quickly as possible. And our primary purpose for being in this business is to make sure people don't get exposed to contaminants, particularly at levels above standards. And so um, there's a lot we don't know about this. I mean, there will be really years of study to understand the, the proper conceptual model for what's happened here. We don't know. Um, if there's an appreciable amount of PFOA in the, in the unsaturated soils above the water table that is still yet to be deposited to the groundwater. We don't know if most of it's already there. We don't, there's a lot of those questions we just don't know the answer to, and I, I'm, I'm not going to try to guess for you because I would just be making things up. Um, the answer to your question about the drought and the fact that we haven't had much precipitation, and we certainly hope to get a lot of precipitation as, near, as soon as possible. Um, to end the drought, um, whether that is likely to cause a spike in concentrations is really hard to say. It's important to understand, like with a system like the MVD system, these are deep, you know, wells. This is a very productive aquifer that they're completed in, and they're pumping, you know, four and five. I think they're pumping capacity at full, full capacity of something like 900 gallons a minute. So, they're pumping a tremendous amount of water. A lot of that water didn't just sort of just get into the formation from last week's rainfall. It's been around for a while. So, you know, there's all those questions. It depends on the well, depends where the well's completed, depends how much it's pumping. Um, I don't know the answer to your question. All I know is, is that because we don't know the answer to that, we're going to keep monitoring. And that's why, you know, MVD's system will be monitored regularly for the foreseeable future to make sure that we know month to month what we're getting, you know, week to week, month to month, what we're getting for concentrations there. So. Thank you, Michael. And Michael, do you have any other questions? Uh, I do. I just I want clarification. Did, was the statement basically that with increased water or rain, that it, they're unknown whether that would affect the numbers? Is that what came out of that statement? Yeah, what I'm saying is that it, we, we can't say for sure. I, I mean, 
based on my knowledge of groundwater science, I would be surprised. That, you know, I, I don't think if we get a rainstorm next week, a big long rain for three days, that we're going to see a meaningful change in the groundwater concentrations the next week. But whether, you know, that, you know, what we really don't know is how much of the contaminant is being added to the groundwater table, if you will, on a real-time basis right now. We know that there's plenty of PFOA throughout both the overburden or, or the, 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 the water table aquifer and the bedrock aquifer in Merrimack and Litchfield and part, you know, parts of Bedford and Amherst. And so, you know, we've got PFOA in the system. What we don't know a lot about and we won't know a lot about until we get a lot more site investigation done and study is how that changes with time and how, you know, uh, temporal changes in precipitation might, might or might not impact it. Yeah. Um, just as a just as a statement, um, based off the research that I've I've done, and based off the actual um, fact sheet that's on your site, it does say that the DS, DES recommends that testing basically be done after heavy rainstorms. These events tend to highlight conditions of improper well construction, poor soil filtration, and also obviously um, some of the other items. So to me, that would correlate with the fact that since we're in a drought, there's a potential, and I'm not saying there is, but there's a potential link that our numbers are declining because of the lack of rain that is filtrating through the system that's pulling the PFOAs down. But just to give some understanding of the board, it, it, the recommendation is to do tests after heavy rainfall, which to me would lead to the understanding that heavy rainfall tends to give you your highest uh, understanding of what's truly in the water. Um, but um, I, I did just have a follow-up question uh, after that is, is the New Hampshire DES doing anything to further the study beyond what the, F, the federal um, regulation or guidelines are, or based off of state law stating that we basically have to comply with the federal law or federal guidelines, I should say, and make that law? Um, is your group kind of going along with those guidelines and then just trying to make sure that all water systems are within those ranges? Uh, we do rely on, you know, federal experts and federal resources for information about the toxicology of chemicals. T to be very candid, those studies take um, lots of money and lots of time, um, and it's not really uh, the state of New Hampshire, and I think most states are not in the business of um, doing, of, of funding and, and, and directing long-term health effects studies. Um, so I, I'm not aware of any health effects studies that the, that the state of New Hampshire is undertaking right now. Um, to the extent that you know, you may be aware that um, perfluorinated compound exposures in, in southern New Hampshire, as well as in the seacoast region around the Peace Trade Port, um, have been a matter of concern for a lot of people. And uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, the State Department of Health and Human Services, has offered blood testing both at the seacoast and in this region. So to that extent, I mean, that, and that's not, that's not quite, that's not exactly a health study, but it's, those are offered in order to give people um, who have concerns about their exposure some information about blood levels of PFCs. But beyond that, um, I'm not aware of any state-sponsored uh, long-term health effects studies that, that, that are being done at the state yeah. level. And as a follow-up to that, has the state reached out to the states of New Jersey or Vermont or even New York? Uh, so New Jersey and Vermont have levels that are far below the federal guidelines to understand why they put those guidelines out there or even to reach out to New York to understand um, what information they may have gathered with uh, their challenges that they're having. Yeah, we, we actually reached out to Vermont. We, we were in communication with the state of Vermont very early on in this process. They were about, I don't know, three or four weeks ahead of us on this, so they had some things to teach us in the early going for sure, and we did meet with them, and, and our toxicologists and health assessors communicated with their counterparts in the state of Vermont, and uh, our people have reviewed the work that they did. And as part of setting uh, our standard, uh, the American Groundwater Quality Standard, um, our folks reviewed that data and concluded that the, uh, the federal data was much more complete and, and defensible, and they elected to, to use that information. But they are aware and they have communicated with the folks in Vermont about the work that they did. No, 
thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions from the board? Administration? Thank you very much for your time and your information. Um, obviously, it's something, you know, it's a, it's a sidebar discussion for us because education is our front and center job here. But with the students we have in our building, there's been a lot of questions. And whatever we can do to educate ourselves further has been um, good for us, good for our, our staff and students and in our constituents. So we thank you for your time. It, it really has gone a long way. You're quite welcome. Thank you. Marge? Um, I just wanted, when Michael is leaving, I just wanted to put for the record um, the names of two other people who really helped me before I got um, to Mike Wimsett. Um, it was trying to figure out who to bring before you. And I want you to know that Dr. Mark Timmerman, who is a physician in town, was very helpful to me. He formerly served on the Merrimack Drug Advisory Council with me years ago. And so I started with him because there was a thought perhaps we should go down a medical path. He in turn led me to the Department of Health and Human Services. Jeff Parrott was the person that I spoke there. And I did want you to know that Dr. Chan, who is the epidemiologist for the state, obviously is one person. He cannot be going out uh, to individual school districts to see them. I mean, it's just too many places to go for one person. And so it was through all that investigation that Mike um, came to the fore. Um, and in this particular case, I think the staging is important for you to realize that all of these persons were very interested in what your queries were, and they all were contributors to getting Mike here tonight. So I wanted you to know that. Thanks. Yes. Oh, Cinda. I was going to say, I think it was Dr. Chan that actually spoke to the citizens of Merrimack um, earlier on with all of this, so I'm sure that that was taped and available um, to people that want to see um, his presentation and what he had brought forward. So if anyone is interested, we could dig that up and find out where that is on Merrimack TV. Thank you. Thanks again, Mike. And now we will be on to item number five which is the proposed district plan, or the proposed plan for district system of care and support. So I invite to the table Julie DeLuca, John Fabrizio, uh, and members of the District Mental Health Committee. So thank you and welcome. We're not turning our backs on you. We just want to know what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you to the school board and to administration for having us this evening on the first day of school, which was simply wonderful. And we are happy to be here this evening to start the school year. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to apologize for not having a copy of the PowerPoint prior to this meeting. There is a lot of information to be shared this evening, and we know this is just the beginning part of many conversations we will continue to have. So should you walk away and have more questions, we are very happy to come back to the board and discuss these questions or any concerns you have. Uh, as of last week, we were in August Academy, and we're still refining uh, the work that we did as we had an opportunity to meet with all the mental health helpers in our district who really helped to provide some critical feedback to the plan that we have before you this evening. So before I have members of the committee introduce themselves, I just want to quickly frame our, our goal for this evening and to discuss uh, some of the things that we'll be talking about. First and foremost, uh, we appreciated the time that you gave us last November. We presented a significant amount of information about why we needed to convene as a committee and to study and to listen and to learn and connect. And that's what we did for a year. We were very purposeful in our approach as we didn't want to solve a problem that we weren't even sure what the problem was. So we spent a year as a committee meeting on a monthly basis, doing work during the summer, and meeting with various 
uh, groups across the state, the Office of Student Wellness out of the New Hampshire DOE, various school districts, and people in higher education to help guide our work. So this evening, this has been a year that we've spent together, and you'll see uh, that we have an action plan. And as we promised, we said we would come forward and have an action plan, and this plan is a multi-year plan. Um, we said and made a commitment to moving very slow and very purposeful in our work. This is a complex issue, not only in Merrimack mental health, but it's a complex issue across the state. And we're being very purposeful in the way that we address it here and uh, appreciate uh, Superintendent Jaffrey and Dr. McLaughlin for their support in providing us the time to even at August Academy to meet as a district mental health group, which hasn't happened for years. So we're very thankful for that. So uh, tonight you'll hear components of our action plan. As I said, there is a significant amount of information. We recognize this. So we're happy to attend future meetings should you want us to really help address specifics, knowing that this action plan will continue to be refined. We're all about refinement and reflecting. So I'm going to ask members of the District Mental Health Committee who did this tremendous work to introduce themselves uh, this evening. Also who is an essential part of this committee that is not here is Christina Lopez. She's a school counselor at the Merrimack Middle School. I also like to acknowledge the work of Tim McMahon who is no longer at the high school but was a past teacher at the high school who was also a major part of this committee. And Stacy Conti who has now replaced Sherry Goldberg who was also a very much an important part of our committee. So thank you for your time. I'm Laura Libby. I'm the behavior specialist here at the Upper Elementary School. I'm Maureen Doro. I'm a school psychologist in the district. John Fabrizio, director of special services. I'm Fern Seiden, the school counselor at Thornton's Ferry. I'm Kathleen Hoppe, the school counselor at Reed's Ferry. Kate Harrington, the school counselor at Master Cola Elementary School. I'm Karen Hammes. I'm the nurse at the high school. At the high school, Deb Barker. So how do we create a district-wide system of support that's not just by helper? What does a district mental health system of care and learning supports look like? When we started our journey as the Mental Health Committee, we asked ourselves three essential questions when we got started. The first one was, what are the depth and scope of the mental health needs in our district? Next, we asked, how do we blend district, state, and community practices to provide a continuum of care? And what do features of an interconnected and systematic framework look like? As we discover the answers to these questions, and teachers are equipped to meet the academic, social, and emotional needs of our at-risk children, then the achievement of all kids will improve. So what is our purpose, and why are we here this evening? I think we looked at, when we said what our purpose is, we started and we said, what else is out there? What can we discover? We researched other frameworks that were out there across the country. What resources do we have both here in our state, in our communities, and, and, and throughout, the, throughout our country actually, looking at research that's been done. And then we had to say, how do we align it with what's starting to work for us, our district response to instructional model? How can we make it available so that model can work? If kids aren't available to learn, they can't learn. So we took some steps to say what steps along this continuum align with that. And we'll tell you a little more about that tonight in our presentation. And then we had a deeper understanding of the needs and the time and the problem and how do we identify that. What is it, how long will this take us? What steps can we take over the course of four years that can help us get to a place where the emotional needs are being met for our students who are at risk with mental health needs? And then how do we, which all this equals is basically developing a system of care. 
and learning supports for students with mental health needs across our district. So we began our process in year one. And our first steps really were to expand our committee. Involvement of a school nurse, who you've just heard speak very eloquently. Then we also had um, Tim McMahon, who was our passenger from the high school, join us. And then we had to meet. We met a lot. We met monthly. And then we met seven times this summer. And as we've all said, even on Fridays when the sun was out, we met this summer. And our, our group um, learned something about each other. We became um, much more um, cohesive as a group and, and as an organization and learned to um, be open and ask questions of each other and ask some, some wonderful why questions of each other and developed relationships. And that's the most important thing when you, when you embark on this work is, is getting multiple opinions and being free to speak and ask questions. And we were able to do that. So we started with a needs assessment, data collection, resource mapping, and research models of care, as I said earlier. Then we had to come up with a multi-year action plan, identify the gaps in our vision, if we want all kids to have a system of care where their mental health needs are taken care, care of, what steps do we have to take from our current state to where we have to get to? And then what are the components involved in this? We need to have more information. We need to get involved. So we did. We went out and we met with the, the State Office of Student Wellness. We had Fern and Laureen join their, their state committee and be on their steering committee to get direct information from the DOE to us. We connected with Concord and Laconia school districts, and we talked to them, and we talked about their relationship with Riverbend and Genesis, their mental health provider in the area. We did more work with Julie and I going up to meet with the Office of Student Wellness and inquiring about what resources we can tap and use, and we were able to use some of those resources during our August Academy. We have connected with Nashville Community Mental Health, and we and we spent some time trying, meeting with them and talking about what's our future hold. There's still work to be done there, and we're going to continue to do that work. And then we have connections to Merrimack State Corps with Laura, with Laura sitting as part of that. Um, we have professional development with, um, with, a, trauma, with a, a trauma workshop out of Dartmouth College. And we've identified various mental health conferences that you'll hear more about. Where are we going this year and what mental health and what mental health training will we do for our staff across the district, in beginning with us. So it all started way back in September with the data. Um, as we began our process of data collection at the beginning of the year, we knew we needed to start with the end in mind. So as the district is already well on its way in developing a strong and balanced RTI model, um, using the same three-tiered system to frame our mental health data was very important to us. Now, organizing social-emotional um, interventions into a traditionally academic three-tiered system could be, it was a little bit tricky, but the committee spent considerable time ensuring that tracking the social-emotional interventions portrayed an accurate, accurate picture of how the district mental health workers were utilizing their time. So if you look at the bottom of the slide, tier one, um, that refers to core instruction that is provided to all students. Now, in the elementary level, this can mean social-emotional classroom instruction. At the middle level, perhaps it's wellness instruction that occurs during their CIA block. And at the high school, um, this means their guidance series that actually is offered to all students, not just the freshman series, as the slide um, notes. Tier 1 interventions can also include programs or building initiatives, such as PBIS or uh, Responsive Classroom, that support an entire school population. Now the second tier, moving up um, the ladder there, refers to supports or interventions that target some students. So this can be in event, in individual or group-based interventions, and they can include things like check-ins, conflict mediation, or even small group counseling. Ideally, these interventions are in addition to the Tier 1 instruction that's already been provided. It is important to note that the Tier 1 activities are proactive, planned, and scheduled interventions that address social, emotional, and needs of students. Tier 2, on the other hand, may include planned interventions, like a small group counseling for friendship skills, for example, but they are for students who require extra instruction or support. Finally, at the top, Tier 3 is provided for a very small percentage of students. 
in the social emotional framework, this type of intervention is typically a crisis that requires immediate attention. So examples include suicide risk screenings, um, students who may be dealing with self-harm, self or students who have recently experienced trauma. Now the committee gathered for five months, uh, or they gathered five months of data from helpers in each of the district schools. Each helper was asked to choose three random days of the month, and they tracked their time they spent in each intervention and which tier throughout the course of the day. Interestingly, the data collected was inconsistent as not every helper was able to complete or even submit their daily trackers for the month. Though we were disappointed, we found that this fact perhaps is the most telling piece of the story that was slowly unfolding to us. Once the data was collected, um, you can move to the next slide. Thanks, John. Once the data was collected, it became clear that indeed our helpers were working hard, but within a reactive, fragmented system that was not meeting the needs of all of our students. The data showed us that 80% of our helpers' time was spent with just 20% of our students. So in another way, 80% of our time was spent in just tier two or two, tier three interventions. Our, hel our helpers were so busy putting out the proverbial fire that we didn't have time to teach students basic fire skills. Or in academic terms, we expected students to read chapter books before they were taught the sounds of the alphabet. The nature of our job often insists that we attend to each and every student and their diverse needs individually and immediately. Although we are prepared to serve this role as district helpers, the time spent on this type of intervention often pulls us from the instruction and implementation of the social emotional supports that meet all of our students' needs. This served as a foundation for our committee work to come, to develop an integrated system of care that supports 100% of our students. So next, Deb is going to talk about the data in a little bit more detail, starting with the YRBS survey. A little defective one. <laughs> so um, my task is to talk about the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. And I believe many of you are familiar with this. I think Merrimack Safeguard uh, has presented uh, the results of the survey to the board several times um, on a regular basis. So this is Merrimack High School data. The YRBS is uh, given to about 15,000 students, 67 public schools. It is given during the day. We give it during the homeroom, an extended homeroom. Um, I believe it's a very strong uh, tool. I think um, it is difficult for, although kids can, uh, you know, trick it and um, make up the answers, but I think for the most part it's, it's a pretty valuable tool and provides good information. Basically, um, we looked primarily at the mental health issues and questions. They asked questions as well about um, just risk-taking behaviors, like how many times have you been in a car and not worn a seat belt? Um, are you wearing a helmet when you're riding your bicycle? But we focused on uh, mainly mental health issues and questions, and of course, for all of us, the most serious um, issues are suicide, um, suicide attempts, depression, and uh, things of that nature. So what we found um, in looking at the results was that su suicide ideation has increased from 18% to 20%. Suicide attempts remained at 7%. Concerns around depression increased from 25% to 33%. Um, so these are serious numbers. And um, it, we honestly uh, work with students and children with these issues every day. Um, and this is part of the reason why uh, my counselors are unable to um, sometimes get those data sheets done. Uh, <laughs> It's, um, if you've picked a random day and you've had a serious issue and you've been tied up with that issue all day, well, the, the data tracker gets put to the side. Um, I believe every kid is at risk. I don't think we have at-risk students. I think every kid that walks through our door is at risk. Um, and it is up to us to uh, try to develop a method of of, of servicing them uh, with a strong structure um, 
that's evidence-based. So uh, if you need more information about the youth, youth Risk Behavior Survey, all of the information is on the New Hampshire DOE. So as we're looking at the data um, going forward, we, we sort of came to the understanding that 80% of our time was spent in that Tier 2 and Tier 3 activities. Um, and, and that essentially means that, you know, that lower group of kids, they're just, they're not um, getting the skills that they need to take care of their own needs. I think that's one of the biggest takeaways that I have from it, that the social emotional education piece is, it's not getting to the kids to take care of their own needs. Um, so the top one there says about one in four days are spent on our crisis intervention, and that's pretty significant. If you think about one in four days, the helpers in the district are, are really taking care of those really serious situations. Um, about 200 students considered suicide last year just at Merrimack um, High School. That's significant. Safety protocols, we don't have a number from the high school, but between elementary through middle school, they, we completed about 51 safety protocols. And um, about 100 students are in pass, about 50, are, or I'm sorry, 80, are, have 504 plans that are specifically for so, with social emotion, social emotional um, modification or accommodations. And that number, that 80 number, has actually gone up over the years for the number of 504s specifically for social emotional issues. So we're definitely getting a picture uh, based on our data of what, what we're seeing with kids. And then some of the other observations that we've sort of seen as we've talked as a group. Um, kids do transition in our district four times in their t you know, if they stay from kindergarten all through high school. Some of our transitions go really, really well. We do have very strong collaborations within schools. Um, so I would say, you know, among the elementary schools, we do really well talking to each other. As kids transition, sometimes pieces of, of that, you know, necessary information don't always get transferred. And, and we, we've talked quite a bit in our, in our group about us feeling like we're silos, that each school is its own individual unit, and communication between schools definitely could be stronger. Um, students with identified needs are suspended less than non-identified students. Um, there's definitely a lot of interns that are, that are providing some essential tier three and tier two interventions. And that's helpful, but one thing that we found is that, you know, year after year as interns change, you know, kids, you know, they, they just get to the point where they're talking about really relevant, important things to help them be more secure in, in school. And then they have a change in caregiver and change in, in intern um, doing, doing some counseling. So that, that's tough on kids. Special ed students, I think we do an amazing job in our district supporting special ed students. It's the non-identified students um, that sometimes transitional pieces get lost. Um, students that are not identified with mental health needs are simply not receiving their supports um, that they, they need to be successful in education. And you know, obviously scheduling is tough. Anytime we talk about doing groups or counseling or check-ins or anything, it's always, well, what are they gonna be pulled from and how do we, May have them make up the work. So definitely a lot of challenges going forward. So we just heard about this data collection process and coming together monthly and kind of pulling all this information together. And the time came that the next chapter in our story was really about, well, we take this and, and what, how are we gonna move forward? And we conceptualize it. This, this is a slide that's really about um, conceptualizing these next steps for for us. Um, the first thing we did was we had that goal in mind and it was really about a multi-tiered system of care, so drawing on the RTI work and the systems work that we have already implemented it to leverage that into this system and that also is parallel to what the state is proposing and working very hard on so that we can kind of um, dovetail with the state's efforts. Um, and so we wanted to address these mental health concerns that are a barrier to learning. And um, 
try to increase at that same time the resiliency of students to handle all sorts of, um, all of the different pressures that they'll encounter. Um, so we wanted to, we saw it in three different ways. We wanted to look at district systems, what systems are in place that are, we can leverage and um, um, utilize, and what are those silos, where are those silos and systems that we can strengthen. Um, we know that there are a lot of protocols and procedures that we can look at, so we want to take a look at those. And then we have these six content areas that we're about to get into where we said, well, we've, we had all this information up that we've collected and we said, what, what, what's missing here? And we returned to some of the learning that we had done um, taking and borrowing from the UCLA model of the system of care that um, offers six content areas. And so those are the content areas that we started channeling all of this information into all of the data that we started getting into and all the gaps and all these things that we had and looked at them within these systems, um, these, these content areas. Um, we also know that we want to um, make sure that we continually um, improve data collection and um, learn more from our data as we go along and so that's that's continually feeding these areas so the the six areas and um, again we're kind of borrowing from UCLA this UCLA model these six areas but we're also taking the um, multi-tiered systems of support from the state and kind of combining them um, so we have classroom based learning supports and we started looking at that as tier one um, student and family special assistance, so working more with um, students and families. Um, crisis assistance and prevention, community outreach and collaborative engagement, home involvement engagement and re-engagement in schooling and supports for transitions. Um, so those are the six areas that as we move toward this action plan, we're gonna learn more about the sort of action um, points that we're gonna be take or the tasks that we're going to be undertaking and so Kate is going to kind of um, get more you know, go more deeply into those areas so you'll look and I know it's overwhelming and um, John if you wouldn't mind just pulling up the whole slide that would be very helpful thank you um, so what we did was we sat down and you know as John stated earlier our goal this year really was to figure out where we were, we were at as a district. And so it was looking at our data, it was looking at what we have for resources now, and then identifying the gaps and really looking at, okay, well, where do we wanna be? What do we want to provide in this district for our students? What's our ultimate goal? And you, you saw earlier that, um, that we would be able to support 100% of our students and that everyone would take ownership over the mental health needs of our students. Um, and so, as we were formulating this plan, Julie always jokes, this is only three years, but she jokes that this committee will never end. Um, and so um, we have our work cut out for us, and, and it will be something that is worthwhile and in investing in. And so um, we bear that in mind, and we know we lay out three years, and realistically it could take longer, and, um, and that's okay. So what we kind of came up with for overall trends is we noticed the importance of education. And so one of the biggest pieces we wanted to focus on for year two was looking for opportunities that we could provide for ourselves and for staff to bring awareness because there's such a, um, such a need for that. I think there, um, there are so many people in this district that are willing and wanting to learn more, but they don't know how. And so we have had some opportunities where we will be vetting certain workshops. We have a workshop called Mental Health First Aid that's appropriate for educators. And we, a couple of us, will be going from the committee to check it out to see if it's appropriate to bring back to our staff and train, hopefully, our whole staff if it's appropriate in that model of what kind of behaviors are evidencing actually emotional problems that are occurring in your classrooms and how do you address them? What are some resources and tools for you right in your classroom to present that proactive and preventative approach? And then also for us, we have um, a couple opportunities where um, there's a training coming up called Prepare, and it's all about crisis training. I know in our building, we've had a couple pretty, pretty big tragedies that have occurred, and how do we respond as a team when that happens, and how do we provide for our students emotionally when those kinds of things occur? So we have some really exciting PD opportunities for us, and hopefully to be able to pilot a little bit with some staff if we think that they're worthwhile. So that's one of our biggest focuses for year two. 
Um, and then next, we want to hear from parents and students. We want to get that voice involved, and that's something that we think is very important. And so we're hoping to hold some focus groups and have that drive. Hopefully, um, they'll align with where our committee is at now and what we found throughout the year, but just making sure we're including that piece um, and making them feel included and involved. We also, um, as John had mentioned before, Nashua um, Community um, Mental Health, is that it? Um, we're trying to form a relationship with them, trying to figure out, we're taking those first steps. So Julie had mentioned before, for us, we really wanted to invest that time in figuring out where we were at before we went out to the community. And so we're gonna look into what kind of resources do we have available for families? We have a lot of families that are in need, that need services, and we all know sometimes it takes a three-month wait to be able to get in and get counseling services for our students. So what's available now and how can we best partner with them in order to provide for their um, emotional health? We also, you know, we've talked a lot about special education and how their referral process and their screenings and their interventions are so solid. And for our students that are not identified yet, that might be on a 504 plan or might still kind of be under the radar, we want to really formalize what that process looks like. How do we help? How do we screen these children? How do we provide the appropriate interventions for them? And so we're looking at how can we formalize that RTI process for social and emotional health. And then we also, as we've mentioned, transition is huge. And we're trying to figure out with in between schools, how we can provide the best pieces, keeping in mind confidentiality, what we can provide across schools as children go up. So as Laura had mentioned before, at elementary we're pretty strong, it's pretty easy to keep that information in our building from teacher to teacher. And as they get older, it's really hard to keep that communication flowing. And so how do we look at a child who, you know, Julie often says, if we have a child that's in elementary school with problems, they're probably going to continue to have similar issues that might not be unresolved in high school. How can we address that and communicate that so we can provide interventions and prevent that from happening in the future, but also passing along the essential information that's important. Um, and then we also are hoping just to focus for um, year two on aligning a social emotional curriculum at the elementary level and so that's going to be our focus for the three elementary schools we talk often that our goal is that each building would send our students up to the upper elementary with the same skills even if it's a different lesson plan um, and maybe even different language sometimes it's still the same set of skills that they're taking away so that they have the same skill set when they get into the upper elementary so that is our goal for year two and if we want to move on to year three, you'll see how we kind of continue on. And so this is when we would hope to roll out our professional development for all of the staff. So let's say that we've really um, enjoyed that mental health, first aid mental health training. It looks like it's going to be very helpful for our classroom teachers. We're hoping to, throughout the year, stage certain um, times where our teachers can be trained in that model and um, hoping that that will help inform them in their practice in their classroom and also for us to continue our, our own professional development as well. Um, we're hoping, this is very exciting, as, as we've talked, sometimes, especially at elementary, you're, you're the only person in your building that does your job. And this committee has been huge in helping us to communicate how different our roles in, in each building, but how we each understand maybe things about our job that other people don't. And having that time to really collaborate and consult with one another, we have some tough cases. We have some, some students that need a lot of help. And sometimes we need help to know how to best help them. And after sitting with our staff at August Academy, we realized they're there now. They want to have opportunities where we can sit together as a team and really figure out how to help these kids that have severe need. And um, so that was exciting and encouraging to see that uh, our mental helper, helpers are there. They're, they're as eager as we are and as excited as we are about the work that we're doing now. Um, we are hoping to because we've had our parent voice, have some workshops available for parents. John 
um, has told us that through special ed and the parent group, we have workshops that are provided, and we're hoping we can incorporate some um, mental health into those workshops for parents. We think that would be very exciting, and that was an opportunity we were unaware of that we didn't know we had at our disposal until we had this committee. So it's cool to see that opportunity come to light, and ho hopefully nailing down at that point some. Um, community resources that would be available. So now that we've reached out with Nashua and we know we can formulate something, a plan or a process for really what we can get out to families. And then at that point we're hoping to have an idea of what our protocols will look like for transition but also for crisis. So we had talked about this year we're hoping to attend those um, crisis management trainings for when there's a, there's a crisis occurs. We're hoping to have that more formalized and then focusing on the social emotional curriculum at the middle school since we're hoping that the elementary school will be all aligned by then. And then if you turn to year four, again we say it like it's the end but we obviously know it's not. <laughs> um, at this point the professional development would occur for any new staff that's coming on. They would be trained in the same training. We would also be continuing that work as the collaboration within the district and branching out a little bit to be more specific case studies that would be presented to our team. Um, and also adding on, we're hoping, some um, clinical supervision from outside providers, bringing in people that are mental health out in the community and getting their voice as well to know what their suggestions might be for the future with, with our students. And at that point, we're hoping we'll have contracted, contracted community resources as well available. So it, we can see it might be a little bit of a slow process, but that's where we're, we're going. Um, focusing on a parent voice on the committee. We would love to have a parent voice here with us on the committee. And then also for students at the middle school and high school, looking at peer-to-peer -peer support. So um, maybe it could be peer mediation. Some of that occurs now with Challenge Day, but more of those kinds of opportunities because we know the power, sometimes a peer can say something so much more powerfully than any of us ever could in our role. And so really utilizing that and utilizing a student voice as well and helping with these mental health needs. By then, hopefully our transition and crisis plans will all be finalized. And then lastly, that we would be able to align a curriculum, a social emotional curriculum at the high school. Um, and we know it's a huge undertaking, but we're all very excited and very passionate about the direction that we're heading in, and we think that we're, we're on the right track. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we know, you know, as you have prefaced that we just got this tonight. There might be some what I would call preliminary questions at this point. I, I'm sorry. I forgot John has one more slide. I apologize. Oh, there is one more slide. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and this is probably um, important to the board because uh, the season we're about to embark on, uh, possible budget implications. And in the 16-17 budget, we all know where we are right now, and the money's really um, happened this summer for PD work and then enabling us um, within our current budget to go off and do some, some research ourselves and look within where we are right now. Cost of materials, things like that, that's what we really have, have used for this year. And that's really about all the only huge budgetary implication right now in our time is the other, the other piece of it that we have to find time for ourselves to meet. Um, and then 16, 17, we have to con consider um, some, some budgetary pieces that may include more professional development, um, consulting support, maybe possibly there may be some pieces that we don't know our avenues yet. And maybe there's pieces that we learned um, working with um, Dartmouth College and, and Dr. Yackley and learned about trauma and maybe there's some some pieces down the road that we may look to, to a consultant to help guide our way a little more. Uh, materials, uh, substitute for teachers for PD if we have to do if we have to do training for them on mental health first aid we may need some some substitute cost. Summer work for this committee, um, more Fridays in the middle of August. Um, and then consideration for expansive related service support current needs. And that one right now is a little vague, and it's written vague on purpose. Sometimes you put language to things that are vague when you haven't quite have all the detail of that. But we're, we're looking right now, and some of our work this year is our current state. Where are we and where are some gaps that maybe through related service budget that I currently have we can look at. And, and if there is increases, we come in that line item to look at kind of how do we help support the current kids we have now identified 
um, under, under um, IEPs and 504s and where we are and how do we help them um, maintain the counseling that's already identified for them in their IEPs and those pieces. Because by doing all that, we are right now in the current state, we're utilizing the staff in front of you. And when we're doing that, as we talked about, spending a lot of time in Tier 2 and Tier 3. And let's look at some of that in this year's budget cycle. And then we move on to 1819. And then that's really, um, it looks at, you know, our consultation services. It looks at professional development for educators and, and family presentations. It looks at materials, again, for more funding, for more professional development support staff now I may reach out to. And then, again, more Fridays in the summer. And then, finally, um, how do we maintain this effort? And this is going to come in and talk about in the 18, 19, 19 year because we'll be moving into our fourth year. And really, where are we going with our system of care and our alignment with student services? How are we creating a place where we sustain and maintain and use what works um, in some of our systems we have in place? We have groups that meet um, continuously. Someone has to guide that. That has to align somewhere. So we'll talk at that point about how does that alignment look when we get into 18, 19. And now I think I'm on. Um, at this part, as you said, uh, as you introduced the PowerPoint that we had just gotten to see as you're presenting it. So we may have some high level questions and of course, you know, as the topic evolves, um, we may need you to come back. You may have more information to come back with. So we look at this just like a lot of our topics lately as something fluid that as the board has a need to address and we'll just invite you back. But at this point, um, I'd like to see if there are any high level questions from the board at this point based on what you've heard tonight. So I think I've seen Andy, Cinda so far, and Naomi. So I'll start with you, Andy, and work our way down. Sure, thanks. This is, this is really good to hear, to hear the details of what you guys worked on, a lot, a lot of really good hard work. Two high-level questions. One, to get to the budget really quick. So we're expecting a, a budget pretty darn soon for 17, 18, but you had a lot of ifs and uncertainties about that. Is, so is your focus over the next couple months to really put some effort and thought into what you're going to ask for? in terms of budget because when we look at budget it'd be good to understand what incrementally you're looking for and sort of batch them so we can see what are attributed to this effort in the short term yeah i can answer that because i think that one thing i want to look at is currently um, where we are with our school psychologists and i think that um i think we'll talk more when it comes to budget time and my time to present to talk about that but where we are we have um an unequal balance right now with some of our services at the high school and middle than we do at the elementary school. And I want to talk about that because we also, um, I believe that one thing we've learned from this is you can get a lot more out of prevention and having some, some, some things at the lower level that maybe um, through cycles of budget in the past we've taken away and maybe it's time to relook at that and bring some of those services back into the district and it might be time for that. So that's probably the number one piece and that's in my related services budget and that's one thing that we will look under like with school psychologists where they currently now lie now. And then um, I, I think that that's probably the, the major factor this year we will look at. Um, it doesn't say it specifically because I, I wanted to leave room over the next couple of weeks for this committee still to meet to see if there's anything else with that piece. Just one point, Andy, and you're absolutely right. It's easier if there's dollars associated with it, mm -hmm. so we know we have that work to do. For example, and the reason why we're being vague is sometimes we just don't know the numbers yet. So, for example, youth mental health first aid, that's a free training that's offered by the state to come in. We're going to vet that first to see if it's appropriate for our staff. And then with that, to find out what are the materials costs that are associated with, if at all. So once we get that number, we'll have staff who's going at the end of, uh, end of this month, will be attending some training, we'll be able to put a dollar to that. Okay. And I just have one other question. And this, I don't expect an answer, I, I don't want an answer now, but having been on Safeguard and seeing the YRBS and seeing it presented here, and seeing the increases, especially at the high school level, I, the attention we have to pay as a district and as a society in Merrimack is, is certainly important. One of the things I found interesting is that as you presented sort of your three-year plan, you started on the bottom to work up because you started talking about the elementary, then the middle, and then the high school. But yet from what we're seeing from data, it appears as though I would have expected effort to be put at the high school first and then trickle down. So you don't have to answer unless you have a good answer. Uh, 
or not a good answer, that's not the wrong word, some rationale for why you chose to do that. But to me, looking from the outside in, I would have hoped to see more high school emphasis in that multi-year plan earlier than I saw. So. Um, the process was really important. Um, so you could ask me about the high school and I could give you my dream scenario. Um, but I think I learned a lot by going back to the beginning and by really understanding where our kids, their experience from elementary on up. That was really helpful to me. Um, I think prevention is absolutely key to this whole process. However, my heart really belongs in um, care for those in need right now. So we're going to try to balance it out and duke it out and figure out <laughs> where, where we can get the best bang for the buck. And, but also by starting at the beginning, I've learned so much not to just have that knee-jerk reaction of, okay, give me two therapists. Because if you gave me two therapists, they'd be full in no time. And that's not solving any of these other issues. So it really was an interesting process, but I would still take the two therapists. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, the, the reason I ask is because you're absolutely right. We've, we've learned over the years that you always build from the bottom with curriculum and work up because you're building the, the basis and the, the, the foundation, so to speak. But we have an immediate problem, too, that I would have hoped that uh, what I, I hope that we as a district take proactive steps while we look at the better, longer term, solve it more at the foundational level. So that's where my question was. Andy, thank you. I think there's more consideration that we need to, as a committee, think about that. We haven't ignored that. A lot of the PD, the fact that we got together as a district mental health group for three days at August Academy was a really big step in that direction where folks, including the high school and the YES program, we have behavior specialists, school nurses, everybody there as a district talking about what are the needs are. We are looking to do professional development that is not just targeted for the elementary schools, but also for the middle and the high school. What we recognize is that the middle and the high school especially is a complex system. There's eight, nine teachers, there's scheduling issues, there's credits. So we understand that change needs to happen. It's just going to be a very slow and methodical change and a very purposeful change, but we know that there's much we still need to continue to do as a district. I appreciate your question because it has me thinking more, are we doing enough? So I think we as a committee will certainly think about that. Cinda? Yeah, uh, kind of along Andy's thoughts, um, as a board, we've spent a lot of time, I would say, over the last year, I think we all walked away from um, the youth risk survey results with a heavy heart. Um, a lot of, you know, issues were really brought up with us and a lot of conversations and actions um, have followed with the board. Um, I think we've doubled up on safeguard as far as the board is concerned and some of the other issues that can kind of stem from this anxiety, depression, you know, such as the drug-related correlation between these things. So I know that we've spent a lot of time focusing on it, maybe through that vantage point. I cannot tell you how excited I am um, that you came and put all of this work together and put a methodical plan together, put all of your time, took time out of, out of your summer because this is really important too, because it's, the way I see it anyways, it's kind of like that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, in order for these kids to learn and to be an adult, they need some coping skills, they need some help, they need some resources that can help them be successful, not only in their school future, but in their overall future. And you guys are living that line every single day. Um, and, and it's not easy sometimes for sure. I'm sure you've had sleepless nights as well as a lot of people, the teachers and everything that work with these kids. But having said that, um, certainly please um, think about what we can do. And as budget season is approaching, maybe we can't do everything or as much. And certainly it needs to be approached in a methodical way because throwing money at something isn't going to solve the problem. But if there's something that can be done to maybe help with these tier threes, 
so that you all can start to focus more carefully on the one and twos more quickly, then let us know. And it might be a, when it comes down to budget time, it might be an option that you know we can maybe s speed up the process if we do this and that. Maybe it's not possible. Maybe you need the time to really lay the groundwork. Maybe you need the time to train the trainer, um, get some of the training that you need. But um, when you start to, you know, when I go back to those, the youth risk behavior results, it, it really breaks my heart. It's really, when you start to look at, you know, 8% attempting suicide and, um, you know, years down the road, you've got, I don't think a week goes by, you don't see someone, a young person dying of a heroin addiction or something like that. So, um, yeah, I guess I would say take that back to the table and certainly it's not even it's not a criticism in any way shape or form it's but it's more importantly for you to know that we are here and I think that I do see a dialogue continuing as we kind of work through some of these things as it relates to the district and some of the resources for families um, maybe some focus groups or some things that we can do to offer some additional support um, to make students successful thank you Naomi Well, I think that um, Cinda just said a lot more, more eloquently than I possibly could about um, the important work that you're doing. I think as the newest member of the board, it's absolutely wonderful to hear how much is being done that may not reach the public's ears on a daily basis that you're doing every single day when you work with the students in our district. Um, and thank you very, very much for it. Uh, this is kind of a, a high opinion question. I know that you've given us this with all this marvelously organized information. What I'd really like to hear is um, what are the greatest challenges that you think stand between you and this plan? And not necessarily the, the list, although it's useful to have them complete, but what are you finding that is on your minds when you think about this and it coming about? Many people would think long ago the, the answer to that question would be money, and it's not that. It's not money. And anybody across the state will tell you the same answer. For us, there are barriers. We're a school system. We have six different schools. We have schools with many transitions. JMU's, they're in. The students are back out. They're in, back out. It's in the elementary schools where we get to have years that we grow relationships. So it's a matter of looking at our system and coming together and figuring out a way that we don't operate in silos, but we operate together. And the amazing thing about our district is we have a commitment towards that. And we have schools that work tremendously. And so it's just now a matter of having these conversations. Superintendent Jaffrey was ahead of her time last year when she asked us to come together as part of this committee. We've gone out to the state and they're like, whoa, you're way ahead. And we're like, no, no, we're not. And because we have significant needs. But what we are way ahead in is that we are collectively working together to identify it. So what are the systems? It could be scheduling. It could be getting into classroom guidance. It maybe it's different classroom guidance. It's a way maybe you have to look at the high school and taking that home room and configuring it so it's an advisory program. It's not just helpers doing the work. It's all of us doing the work. And there's where the PD for the educators so that they're providing classrooms that are safe learning environments for all kids, that we just don't own it, but we all do. And educators will do that, they just haven't been trained. And so we now we have training. What is anxiety? What is depression? What does trauma look like in the classroom? And how do we equip our educators to do that? That takes time. We have the commitment. So I think it's just sometimes our structures, just because we are a school, and we are not going to be mental health providers, but we certainly will work in a system to help provide for the needs of kids. I hope that answered that. And please, if anybody else in the committee wants to weigh in. I'll just weigh in too that, that um, I watch this daily. And, and what I do in my world is I have, um, you know, I was looking at some of our numbers the other day, and we have a, a lot of students in the world of um, identified with other health impairments. and and and. and emotional disabilities and many of them 
um, I look at, and I think Andy hit on my fear, I think, right away when he talked about what about the now and the today and the here. And I know it takes a while to build the system, and I always know that in, in that piece. And I think that it's so important that, to me, I think in my biggest, my biggest hope that is we build those community connections, and we build those connections to, to national community health, and we, and we are strong with them eventually someday soon. And that it's not only um, our six and a half hours a day that we try to extend as much as we can. It's kind of beyond that in the weekends, in the at-risk times. I mean, they're safe for the majority of the part when they're with us. And we can care and take care of them. It's when they go beyond our walls. That's all of our fears, I think. It's like we can do that here. What happens beyond? How do we connect them to resources? How do we have those resources come forward to attach to us? That's a piece that we have to continue to work on. You all set? Michael, do you have any questions of the committee? Uh, I, I unfortunately do not, just because I wasn't able to actually see the presentation. What I'd like to do is obviously uh, take the time to review the uh, video after it comes out and then possibly send in any questions or if we have a follow-up meeting, uh, discuss them at that time. Sounds like a plan. Thank you, Michael. Um, I have so, so much is swimming in my head. Um, I wrote a note down as you were talking earlier about rolling out um, the plan over three, four years. And I looked at the technology plan that we did and something Nancy Rose said, and I think it applies so much to what the work you're doing. She said, I could go out and I could buy all the technology in the world and throw it in front of you and it will collect dust because no one will know how to apply the technology. So really the methodical collection training, distribution training, follow-up study. If you don't have that, if, again, if we throw it all out at you, you know, with, well, you know, we could budget, you know, a, the rainbow and unicorn number that you want, not having the time to roll it out effectively, you've just front-loaded the budget, but you haven't actually been able to solve the, solve the problem. So I think that's something that we need to look at as we're supporting your committee, look at it as we're supporting you through our budgets, uh, through our um, efforts, um, through our position in our role as a, as, a, as a body here, but you you need time to get the information you want. Um, but it led me to some questions on how you would be able to do some of that. And um, one of the notes I had was about parent and peer um, activity and, and, and uh, roles in, in this process. and with the whole concern of um, confidentiality, you know, how do you take a case study and not be able to correlate that with a student in which that case study was based? You know, those are the things I think if we did roll it out today, we wouldn't have the checks and balances in place to be able to roll it out um, safely. I think that's the right word, and, and appropriately. So there's a lot on your plate. So for those who, um, who think that one year has, has gotten a lot, you've got a lot ahead of you too. Um, and, and that really did uh, resonate, and I wanted you to know that. Uh, workshops for parents, I heard, and that's, to me, I think the parent having that role to be able to extend your efforts in the classroom to home, to identify what you're seeing in the building. Because, um, you know, as, as parents were like, well, we have a totally different kid at home than you have in the classroom. Like, little Johnny was perfect today, and I'm like, he just, like, you know, put every, dirty glass like all over the house. How's he so orderly and organized in your classroom? How's this the same kid? So being able to find those indicators at home and, and look for the right things to, to correlate the classroom child to the domestic child. And, and I think that's important because you know that partnership will, will flourish with, uh, with parent and school. Um, but the questions I had were, uh, the questions I had were about tier one intervention in different levels of schooling. I know the further up you go, in middle and high school, every subject has a different area. You integrate it into health and PE. You do that K through 12, so it's a consistent place to identify it. I mean, how do you look at science and, I mean, where, where does tier one intervention fall in, in, in your implementation? And that, I mean, do you have thoughts on that just based on your study so far? You I got just, you dead. Yeah, I know. Sorry. <laughs> I can just talk about the high school. So um, 
The guidance counselors do go into all four um, freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior classrooms and do um, guidance curriculum, and that would be tier one work. Um, the homeroom advisory program is up and running and is getting better and better with each year, and that would be tier one work. But also within the discipline, within a regular old English class is tier one. You can bring home the lessons and, re in, and relate it to literature, um, in, in social studies. It just, there are ways of doing it in the classroom. And what we really learned from our August Academy about trauma sensitive schools is that everybody can do this. Everybody. It is not just the counselor. It, it, we don't have the magic. It really is everybody from um, the school secretaries to um, the wh who I think are the saints are the folks that work in the lunchroom. Okay, uh, uh, last year we have um, I don't think she's with us any longer, but we had a, a woman who worked in our snack bar, and um, I talk about her a little bit. When the kids would go up to her, I would always go get my coffee at quarter of nine. I couldn't wait any longer, and um, I would go down and I would watch the, some of the kids go and, and get their food from her. She knew every single child's name. She knew what they wanted. They, she knew what kind of cream cheese to give them with their bagel, and that's tier one. That's letting a student know that somebody remembers them, cares about them, thinks about them, wants them to be there. I mean, that was the best. When I saw that, I thought, we need more of, of folks like that. So tier one at the high school looks a little bit different. We're not all sitting in a little circle with our you know, legs crossed. <laughs> We're not doing that. But honestly, it can be across the board. You sit in circles, right? <laughs> Crisscross applesauce. <laughs> so we don't always sit in circles, Deb. <laughs> but I think you know we've done a lot of work with curriculum, especially on the acad academic side of the house, and so we know a lot about curriculum and instruction. And so what we're talking about is we have a great deal of different curriculums that are happening. You have responsive classroom at reads, classroom guidance. You have all these different, but we want to have a scope and sequence. So when Laura Livy tells a story about when she's working with kids, the first question she asks is, what school are they from? Because then she knows what she needs to, okay, I need to use this tool or this tool. That's hard. So we have to be more aligned in that. And again, it's having those conversations. At middle school and high school, absolutely, it's that integration work. August Academy, integration. And so that is this work. It's not just us doing this. It's how is this integrated in the classroom so that kids feel connected and kids feel safe. And how do we give them the social and emotional skills to regulate themselves so come middle school and high school, they have the skills of what to do when they're anxious or when they're feeling out of control. And we're doing that work already. It's just we have to be more aligned. But I appreciate you asking the question, Shannon. Thank you. And I think you just kind of topped off one of my last note on the page, which is um, part of our, the backbone of our education is to get our students for work and college ready. And if they don't have the emotional structure and strength, they're not going to be work or college ready going out into the field. So I think that the work that you're doing is, is definitely going to pay dividends, you know, outside the classroom and into the workplace as well. So that's, that's important for, you know, as we talk about education and we, you know, it's refreshing to talk about education and not water for a little while, but <laughs> it's been a lot of water this summer. But uh, we definitely want to talk about, you know, how it, how it does, fold, all the work that you're doing folds into the big picture. And, it, and I think your answer to the last question does it in every step of the way. So that, that, I think that's important for us to acknowledge. So I thank you. Um, were there any other questions of the board or administration? Go ahead. So uh, just to build off what, um, what, off the answers that you got to your question, it was a very important question. You know, you've heard a lot of um, references tonight really to sort of redefining. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in my parts coming up. Um, but we're talking about redefining some traditional ways of doing things. And one of the things that we talked about last year at August Academy that you've heard us talk a little bit about over the course of last year, and you'll certainly hear us talk about it more this year, is this notion of mindset and the idea that um, 
in the past, there were sort of well-defined roles and expectations for individual teachers. I'm a third grade teacher. I teach reading, writing, social studies, and science. And, and that's true, and that's historically true, and it's also a mindset. And we're redefining the mindset as part of Tier 1 to suggest that in addition to those things, it really is, you really are an integral part of the fullness of the child's experience, including their emotional needs. And so that's the work, one among the very powerful things this group is doing is redefining the mindset of what it means to be a teacher and the things that it now includes. But they also recognize that it's not going to happen without support for the professionals who are going to be doing this work. But I just want to point out that that, that these aren't things that we just talked about last year and they fall off the, the, uh, the edge of the earth. They really are integral to sort of the redefinition of how we're approaching education now. It's different, and in many ways it's going to look different, and that's, that's a, key, a key component of how it's going to look different. Really what Tier 1 means is truly all hands are on deck, even in those parts of a child's day um, where they interact with people who didn't used to have that be a part of their job, it now is. So that's one of the very powerful things that this group is helping us all to recognize. Thank you. Are there any questions at this time from the board or administration? Seeing none, I thank you all for your time. This is a lot of work and we look forward to hearing more. And as they are tearing down, um, we will transition over to Dr. Mark McLaughlin, which will be reviewing the 2016 district assessment results for Smarter, Balanced, and SAT. So um, along the lines of what I've just <clears throat> um, commented on, um, without getting into a lot of, you know, kind of needless detail, I, I, I just would say to you that when we think about um, assessment reporting now. Um, think about what we just talked about in terms of redefining. Um, it really is a different world now. Under No Child Left Behind, uh, as it was originally constructed, part of the um, expectation was that there was adequate yearly progress made from year to year to year, such that by the year 2014, all students would be um, proficient. And that was how the law was written. And every year from the late 90s up to 2014, um, the results from NECAP in New Hampshire or MCAS in Massachusetts or FCAT in Florida were always geared toward defining um, where our students were at a point in time relative to um, 2014, how many students were progressing adequately, how many students had fallen off. That was reported yearly gets put in the paper, and, and then we do an analysis, and if we see that numbers and operations are low for us, then we throw resources at numbers and operations, and yet, as you heard tonight, there are lots and lots and lots of factors that contribute to a, an individual student's success or a cohort's success or lack of success, and just like throwing financial resources at a problem doesn't necessarily equal an outcome, so to doing a data analysis, seeing where, where a cohort of students is falling, um, does it necessarily mean that if you just focus on those results that you'll get a result you want? Doesn't mean you don't pay attention to it, but it, it, it doesn't have the, and I think we saw that when we got closer to 2014 and vast majority of students nationally were not closing in on proficient, um, then uh, as it was defined by NCLB, we thought, okay, maybe there has to be several different metrics. And so over time, that um, came into play. And now we have uh, a completely different view of the way we interpret assessments. And the best way I can tell you is that um, Smarter Balance um, is intended to be um, seen as a data point. Whereas, when I used to report NECAP results, they were kind of summative assessments, the idea being that all the work that was done in the year prior would have culminated in a test that would have produced a result that would have shown growth. That's 
different. So I just want to say that because it's very important to kind of cast aside what we used to think when I would do these um, reports and, and, and what we need to think about now. So I'm just going to um, uh, quote from, from, the, from the state in its directions to, um, to districts. Um, defining achievement levels is a reporting feature that's federally required under No Child Left Behind, uh, the reauthorized No Child Left Behind, and one that has become familiar to many educators. This is the important part. However, characterizing a student's achievement solely in terms of falling in one of four categories is an oversimplification. Um, achievement levels should not be interpreted as infallible predictors of students' future success. They must be continuously validated and should only be used in the context of multiple sources of information that we have about students and our schools. So um, that is the basis with which we have to start thinking about hearing reports about scores. Um, I'm pleased to tell you that um, so every year uh, we apply for um, federal funds, um, uh, federal 2A funds that uh, covers some of our work. And as part of that, we have to demonstrate um, that we have conducted what's called a gap analysis, which is to show that our students with special needs and limited English needs and uh, economic disadvantage needs are being served equal to that of regular ed students with no disadvantage. And we have to demonstrate that. In the past, the only measure that we've been allowed to use to demonstrate that was NECAP. So they disaggregate results based on um, the typical student and all, all other students in categories. And then off of that, we, we talk about uh, what we're trying to do, and then we submit that to the state. This year, we don't have any trend data because Smarter Balance is only in its second year. So we had to, under the direction of the state, create an entirely different way to describe how we are attending to the needs of all students so that there are no gaps. And what you heard John and Julie and the team talk about tonight was response to intervention, which really at its heart means that we don't pay any more attention to a student with um, a, a learning disability or a physical challenge than we do to a student, a typically uh, performing student, or a student on the other end of the spectrum who is uh, really succeeding and moving along. We attend equally to all students. They have different needs, but we must attend to all students. And so, bearing that in mind, um, we were able to craft a, um, a uh, statement to the, to the state that describes, and I'll send this to you tomorrow uh, for you to be able to you know, really focus and, and think, but um, that talks about all of the different assessments that we are using, all of which produce results that our individual data teams at each school, um, under the guidance of teacher leaders and data facilitators, review, sometimes weekly, sometimes bi-weekly, but always regularly, to triangulate these results to be able to um, more accurately measure a student's progress. So multiple test results, multiple assessment results over time are used to develop an individual student profile that is used to inform instruction, to make choices uh, about where we focus, where we lay off because the student has, has achieved. That is a very different um, construct than what it used to be, which is all eggs in one assessment basket look at the results, and then make curriculum choices based on that. So, um, so what, we, what we now have is an opportunity to use our Smarter Balance results as one data point. So what I have for you tonight, and I'll just, I'll walk you through this. I could hand that to you. I'll wait till you receive it. And I, it goes without saying, I'm happy to um, talk to you at any time about this. It's just helpful uh, at first blush to be able to walk you through these together. Um, so uh, the uh, most uh, 
so you have at the top you have ELA 2015, so we have only now two years of data. We have ELA 2015 and ELA 2016, and they report based on uh, students who achieve, have uh, reached achievement levels of proficient or advanced. So these numbers, these percents, reflect proficient and advanced. So in 2015, you notice in yellow, you see 58% of students at grade three performed at th uh, uh, achievement levels three or four. Now if you look at yellow, the next yellow under 2016, that's a cohort. And I know that when we presented in the past, the board appreciated cohort data. We don't have multiple years of cohort data anymore. So, so if you see the yellow, you see that that same group now in fourth grade in the spring, this past spring, um, also 58% of those students achieved uh, achievement levels of three or four. That's proficient or advanced. Um, if you look at grade four in 2015, 48% achieved proficient or advanced. And then that same group in group in grade five, 57% of those students achieved uh, proficient or advanced in 2016. And likewise, I don't need to read these all to you, you see how it goes. Just below that, in math, you see the same attempt to begin to show cohort data. Uh, it's important for the board also to know that we have one year of assessment data, S, uh, smarter balance data for grade 11 before the state decided to opt out of smarter balance at grade 11 and instead um, uh, move to the SAT. And so we don't have any um, longitudinal data on grade 11 because in the second year they switched. I'll talk about SAT in just a second. Um, so again, what we are doing now is taking these results, adding them to the district's um, assessment uh, field that we employ pre-K through 12, which is itemized in the um, summary that I sent to the state that was approved. Um, and that together forms our basis for making instructional decisions about students. So um, if the temptation, again, at the risk of beating a dead horse, if the temptation is to um, look at this and think that it tells the same story as kneecap data, it, it doesn't. The other thing, and I've said this to you before, um, but the other thing that's really important to bear in mind is that Smarter Balance is a qualitatively different assessment than kneecap. Um, and I, 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 I don't, this may sound like a value judgment, I don't mean it to. It's factually true that kneecap primarily was a, um, you know, a true false, uh, fill in the blank um, sort of kind of test. Um, it did not um, require as much application as Smarter Balance does. This isn't a value judgment, it's just a fact. However, the fact reflects what we know to be true about um, what a dem demonstrated mastery is supposed to look like. It's that a student has content knowledge but then can apply and do something with that knowledge as demonstrated on an assessment. And that's what Smarter Balance does more fully than its predecessor. So um, also, it's impossible to compare results from one assessment to the previous assessment because it's so qualitatively different. So um, moving on to um, the SAT. Um, the board may be aware that um, in the past, uh, students um, opted to take the SAT or not, and did so at a variety of um, uh, times throughout the school year. Um, the state uh, now, through, uh, through their own initiative, um, dedicated what they call an SAT, SAT school day it was in March of 2016 this past year. It will be April 4 in this coming year. Um, 
for the administration of the SAT for all students. Um, the district um, picked up the price of the essay component um, for students, so most of our students took the essay, which was not uh, funded by the state. Um, and so this is preliminary, oh, and I should say um, that the, uh, the state is happy to, for, for uh, me to talk about this, but really want me to say that this is preliminary data um, because there's a final piece of, um, of uh, statistics that get applied. Nothing significant will change, uh, but just until that happens, we're supposed to call this preliminary. So I say that. So anyway, preliminary. Um, so uh, what I can tell you is that um, the uh, ERW mean score, so ERW, if you look below, is evidence-based reading and writing. The ERW mean score out of 800 for students in grade 11 at Merrimack High School was 529 out of 800. The, ER, the math mean score out of 800 for grade 11 students at Merrimack High School was 518. Now, when it says meeting or exceeding benchmark district combined, what that means is that they take the ERW, evidence-based reading and writing, and they combine that with math, and they produce a percentage of students uh, meeting or exceeding the benchmark. And that number is 45. So 45 percent of our students met or exceeded the benchmark for ERW and math. Compare that to the state at 39 percent. Finally, um, as I indicated to you, the um, district funded um, the uh, students taking the essay under the idea that we don't want to disadvantage a college applicant um, who would submit SAT scores that didn't include the writing because the state didn't pay for it and, and maybe some people would pay for it and others wouldn't, so we did. Um, so uh, the SAT essay out of a mean score of eight, it's broken down, the essay is broken down into three parts, reading, analysis, and writing. And what I've done is on the opposite page opposite side of this page, um, I've just crafted for you a summary of what each component requires so that you can see what the expectations are. Um, and if you, um, if you um, remember discussions about kneecap, here's one place where we can refer. Uh, we have traditionally found that students, um, if they have some work to do, it's on the analysis and application. So it would be um, the um, uh, proving a point, persuasive writing, um, or um, uh, word problems in math where they are required to sort of discuss their reasoning and how they got to this, or in science and so on. So. Um, roughly it's compatible and we still see um, as they do across the state that that's probably never going to change in in the sense of it being a challenge for students if anything's going to be a real higher order challenge that's it um, when I talk about August Academy in a few minutes I'll talk about some efforts that we're putting in place to try to continue to address what I think is going to be true as long as there are students in schools um, however um, so, as with the other um, presentation, there's a lot to take in. I'm really happy to talk to you anytime about it. I just appreciate the opportunity to, at least initially tonight, sort of walk you through um, because this represents such a different way to look at data. Are there questions from the board now? Yes, Zeb. Uh, yes, yeah, so I would like to say that um, I actually was in 11th grade last year and I was part of the first class of people that actually took these tests. And personally, I'd like to say, first of all, thank you for uh, paying the cost of the SAT. It was really helpful for me um, and I really appreciate that. And second, I want to say that I don't think that these scores actually represent um, 
the level of the students at Merrimack High School because while I was taking the SAT, I noticed that there were many kids sleeping during the test, filling in random bubbles, not actually paying attention to what was happening. And so I feel that a lot of the students at Merrimack High School aren't actually taking advantage of the opportunity to take these tests. And so I think it's important to understand that these results aren't an accurate representation of the uh, level of knowledge at my high school. I appreciate that. It's an interesting point um, that Zev raises. The, um, the most um, explicit reason stated for moving to SAT was the idea that um, students might not be as familiar with Smarter Balance and therefore might not take it as seriously and SAT being a relatively known commodity might engender uh, a little bit more um, effort. Um, and that may be true for some, but it may not be true for others. So the important point is that, um, you know, numbers tell a story and, and, and then Sometimes in what they don't tell, they tell a different story. <laughs> so uh, it's just very important that we take that into consideration. So I appreciate it. Andy? So you may not know the answer to this question, but when we um, had testimony from the public as well as other stuff about the, the Smarter Balance testing, there were two dimensions of it. One was the, the way they were graded, and the other was around data security of things in terms of what we had to share in the district and what is shared outside the district. Can you share any observations of what we as a district encountered with, in terms of data sharing, what we were required to provide to the state, how it was done, anything like that? Um, what you were, um, what was described to you by Mike Schwartz several years ago um, proved to be exactly true. Um, there is, um, it is, I mean, it's tighter than Fort Knox. <laughs> um, the questions um, are, so, so what I can tell you is that um, the security that was promised to you was delivered, um, as, simply as, I can, as simply as I can tell you. Um, we are not required to r report any identifying information um, uh, to any entity, um, so. I don't No, that's why I just, yeah. the question will come up. I wanted mm -hmm. to make sure that we mm -hmm. discussed it at least briefly at the mm -hmm. table. And it's especially interesting because when we first were talking about it, we were talking about um, Smarter Balance and, and some of the issues there. Now that the state has allowed us to take SAT tests, mm -hmm. is that data shared? I mean, is it shared in the same way it was if a student had taken it on their own accord in previous years? It's just that everybody takes it now so the data is shared in the same way? My understanding is that the um, individual student results are mailed from the College Board directly to the families. Um, we, we do not, and Zev may have, yeah. Yes, I can attest to that. They are mailed in the, and they do also email you if you fill out your information on the sheet. So it is, the, your scores are sent directly to you and your family. Great. Just as, a, as an example of security, um, in order for me to get the data here, mm -hmm. um, I, I did not have the proper permissions and I needed to be in touch with four different people uh, uh, to agree to allow me access to the data so I could pull it together for you. So um, I don't know if we define that as tight, but I, I, I felt tight to me. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. Um, and just to close up the thought on the SAT, so schools typically would get copies of results of students that were taking it, and, and that was usually named, right? Mm -hmm. so, you, so you know the student's name and what they got. Mm -hmm. When that data is then given to the state to prove that, that it was used in supposed a smarter balance, is it sort of uh, turned into non-identifiable you know, non data at that point when it's shared? So I, I just I want to be sure I understand your question. So could would you just say that again? So I'm sure I understand. So normally when a senior takes an SAT, uh -huh. they send the results to colleges they select. Parents get a copy, and high schools typically get a copy of the results mm -hmm. with their name next to it, so you can see that mm -hmm. that Joe got this on his SATs. In order to fulfill that 
the smarter balance requirement as opposed to the smarter balance exam. I'm assuming that the culmination or the, those individual scores are somehow rolled up and provided to the That's state. That's correct. And oh, to the state, yes. Well, That's right, because they got to have the evidence that you have provided this and things. Is that data treated in the same way that the smarter balance results are? Do you know? Um, I can't. I can't tell you that. Uh, this is the first year. That's something I can certainly look into. But my understanding is that it would be treated no differently than the smarter balance results. It, it'd just be good. I mean, I don't want it as an agenda topic. But should a resident ask, mm -hmm. we just. I'd like us to be prepared with the data. Mm -hmm. That's all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions of the board? Um, the question that I had, uh, Michael, I'm sorry, you wrestled. <laughs> I, I, don't really, I don't have as many questions. Um, I do like that, uh, you know, the smarter balance definitely has a different way to assess the children than uh, the multi uh, channel approach, which I think is better than just a single. Um, I thought it was very interesting to see that, uh, you know, there, there are practice tests that are on the site. You guys, some of you, some of the individuals that have been on the board before may know this already, but uh, I thought it was interesting to see that both parents, uh, teachers, children, there are tests, um, practice tests on the website, and I'm also very intrigued to see that uh, over 250 colleges are actually accepting the Smarter Balance as a means to actually uh, submit their scores for college um, acceptance. So looks like that's growing too, but I just thought it was very interesting that the, uh, the assessment itself is a lot different than what uh, myself and others probably grew up with, and I'm glad to see that there's some change. Um, the only question I had, and you may not have it tonight, and that's fine, is um, something that Zev actually said earlier was that some students didn't take the SAT seriously because they probably wouldn't have taken the SAT at all, I'm guessing. Um, so what percentage of our students prior to the SAT being a measured test for student performance, um, what percentage of our student body would have taken the SAT in their junior or senior year, mm. or at least before they graduated? Yeah, so I can get that to you. Uh, you mean prior to this being this a requirement? This being a measured Yes, yes, uh, I can get that to you. Great. I know that uh, science is also going to be on a future agenda item, mm -hmm. so it might be a nice time to, if, you, if there's any other data to share off this, to mm -hmm. circle back and... Mm -hmm and just uh, highlight what we might not have gotten since it's preliminary data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. um, so are there any other questions or comments from the board on the data? Marge. Not on the data, but I wanted to just talk about process because I think this was important. It would be interesting to see if um, it had any relevance to what Zev said. And that is one of the concerns that Mark and I had is when juniors took Smarter Balance in its first year, in only year, it was all computer based. And I think the students were very serious of purpose and they were almost, if you will, intrigued um, that it was on the computer. And of course, we spent a lot of time helping our third through eighth graders prepare for that. When we um, dealt with a college board this last year um, and for going to the SAT, they were not prepared uh, to have us um, have computer based and so we went back to pencil paper and I would be very intrigued if methodology or uh, that had any bearing on the student's seriousness of purpose or whatever where you talked in terms of how they were filling in the blanks um, that was something that we really felt we were giving up um, because also when it's computer based you can get your results much faster too and when it's pencil paper you have a longer period of time to wait. So interesting when you change instruments, um, what happens? I think that's an important factor. Excellent. Thank you. So with that, um, thank you, Mark, for the assessment results. And we are going to the first reading of the board policy with Marge to give you just a little breather. And I think we're back with you, Mark, after that. So, um, as you know, you have on uh, the consent agenda tonight the policy that you've been working over the past two board meetings, and now I'm giving you another one that would be considered new. Um, our school boards for uh, over 15 years uh, have had a student member um, on the board. However, it's been our practice, but we have not had the policy that went with it. So as we're looking at membership on the board and um, officers, 
it seemed that it would be a good thing to put into place um, to have it um, as a matter of policy. Um, also, um, important for you to know that not only did I look at the um, model policy that the New Hampshire School Boards Association puts forward, but I also conferred with Principal Johnson, and so you'll see that we made um, one modification to it. I will highlight that when I get there. So the title is Student Members of the School Board. The board may choose to add one or more student members from the district high school. Student members will serve one-year terms. Student members will not have the right to vote. Student members will be excluded from all non-public sessions the board enters. Student members will be chosen by a vote of the student council. Student members are expected to, one, attend all school board meetings, two, represent all high school students within the district, three, present to the school board specific proposals and ideas from the high school student body, four, serve as a liaison between students, district staff, and the board, and five, keep the student body informed of board business and actions, six, comply with all board policies relative to students and board members when applicable. The board reserves the right to discontinue the addition of student members at any time. The legal references are revised statutes annotated 189-1-C, school, school board student member, and revised statutes annotated 194-23F, high school student as a board member. The piece that was changed for us is the second paragraph which says student members will be chosen by a vote of the student council. If you look at this RSA, you'll see a reference to uh, a vote being taken by the entire student body. And our representatives have come from a smaller group. Um, student council is preferred because that's the governing body, if you will, of the high school. Um, in Zev's case, he sits on student congress and was named before this policy is in place. So we're looking at this for the future. The beauty of a school board uh, model policy is that it's put forward by the association and then each local district crafts it as it needs to be crafted. So that's the one major difference I would point out. Are there any questions? Cinda. I just had a thought, which was, <clears throat> excuse me, regarding number one, where it says student members are expected to attend all school board meetings. I wondered if we might want to rephrase it to something like to have a good attendance and notify um, the chairperson of the school board should they be absent or something like that. Because attend all school board meetings, you know, if they're having final exams or something like that, then that doesn't, it's not quite reasonable to me. I, they should be focusing on their final exams, in my opinion. Um, so I'll work on the wording, and I also want you to know that Zev um, met with me um, prior to the meeting today, as I um, um, want to do with all student reps. And what I asked him to do is if he um, had um, times that he needed to be out for high holy days or whatever, that he would notify my office, simply thinking it was easier. So um, we've talked about that already. But I'll go back and try to be, um, um, you know, less taxing on number one. I'll come up with something there. Okay. We'll confer. Okay. And to that end, I would say during the school year, because I do know that uh, student reps, we don't want to feel our, especially if they get voted in in June, have to go to meetings once the uh, graduation happens. So I just want to make sure it's realistic. Are there any other edits or? Um, so this will come before the board again for our next meeting. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Michael. You have to rustle. Yeah. Let's let me know. <laughs> uh, let me Um, I just um, I just had a question regarding number two. Um, we 
all high school students within the district. Um, since as a student member, are they representing all school students within the district? So if someone were to come to uh, the student member, that, that student uh, member would then be representing them in any meetings or anything like that? I understand that they're voted on by the high school and that they're high school representative, but I feel that we're limiting it and might be better as a broader scope so that all students know that they could go to that student member with uh, any questions or concerns or anything like that. So my um, answer to you, Mike, is that really, as this was crafted by the legislature, it specifies high school. And I think it's because, um, first of all, you would have direct interaction with those um, where you are located. But also it has a connection, too, um, to the fact that students are going through social studies and courses in government governing and so it really is a connection to what they're learning. So it's specifically um, for high school. I, I guess I would have to, uh, I guess I might have to take a sidebar and just take a further discussion just to understand that is, is that what the student body member is for is to have that interaction with the school board because of social studies or is it to represent the student body? No, I'm just saying that the, I'm saying that there's a relevance to that, but more importantly, it's what the, it is what the statute calls for. So I, we're taking this right from the RSA. Yeah, and no, I understand it's coming from the RSA. I just was wondering if, you know, just I think it's a broader scope allows for that interpretation if, if you know, other students are, you know, want to interact that they don't, I'm not sure that they would read the policy, but if they were to read the policy, they didn't feel like they were not uh, represented or something like that. Zev, did you have some feedback? Uh, yes. So personally, I don't believe that I could represent the other schools as well as I could the high school just because on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't actually interact with the students at those other schools. So um, while I'm not opposed to representing them, I don't believe it would be in their best interest to have uh, me representing them when I don't understand uh, their problems and I'm not interacting with them on a day-to-day -day basis. I believe that because um, I'm an active member of the high school that I'm, uh, it's very easy to get into contact with me in terms of um, interactions with other high school students and I believe that I could represent them to the best of my ability and I don't believe that I could say the same thing for the other students around the district. Thank you. Um, so if, again we're going to do another reading at the next meeting, so if there are questions that come up or suggested edits, we can still keep going with this. Um, the one thing I will have to say is, um, this is my seventh year on the board, is the student body has, um, I've had to go before the student congress once uh, with the last chair um, as the vice chair, and it was because of the color of the bleachers. They needed to understand how the color came to be. Um, but other than that, that uh, liaison with the student representative has been very helpful to make sure that any communication that the student body has had a concern with um, through their student congress representatives. I believe every homeroom has a representative in the student congress, plus you have officers, I think, at class levels and school level, at least, correct? And club captains. Wow, you got a lot. Um, so there's quite a, a diverse pool of representation. So. Um, that all filters into one voice, which is our student rep. And that does give us the opportunity to also disseminate the answers to those questions. Um, and the student rep has also historically given us great insights about what's going on in the school on a you know, month to month basis, activities, accomplishments, and that kind of thing. And um, the student rep has also been good, good about um, expressing our acknowledgement of their accomplishments back down. And, our pride in, in the efforts that they're making. So I think that that's, that's the spirit and what this is written to do. And um, I don't think about at this point, unless we as a board want to materially change that, then we would have to probably tear this down and, and build it back up from scratch and we'd have to deal with RSAs and all that other stuff. So I hate to go too far afoot from, the, from um, its intent, but I think that's a, a historical represent representation of what we've had to do and that has you know we're always available to the student congress and let them know that too but the need to have us there hasn't been as necessary because you've been so strong in representing um, the, the district for us so 
So we look forward to you doing that for the rest of the year. So we kind of set the stage for you, Zev. <laughs> but uh, if there are any other questions, again, we will have this at our next meeting. If there are any other edits, wordsmithing, anything like that, um, you want to bring the margins attention, um, you can do that as well because this is a first reading and you may, from our dialogue, think of something else. And we always encourage that so we can streamline the process. But uh, again, go through Marge so we don't have a unnecessary um, quorum issue. Uh, so uh, if there are no other questions, we will go on to item number eight and we're back to Mark McLaughlin, which is a review of the August Academy and the first day of school. Well, this is uh, really a pleasure to talk to you about. <clears throat> so as you know, for the last several years now, um, our professional development um, program has been uh, different in that we um, have uh, been allowed to um, front load our professional development for three days, which um, provides us an opportunity to really explore certain, um, certain things rather than to have to, you know, have a day and then, and then um, sort of just let that go and months pass and then another day. Um, the academy model has really allowed us to dig deep. And this year, um, we wanted very much to have um, the academy be a natural sequence from last year. So if last year's academy really um, had to do with establishing a, 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 a habit of mind, um, or a mindset for inquiry in the classroom as a planful way to deliver content um, where students are active participants in, the, um, in their knowledge and understanding. Um, then this year was, um, uh, and then last year was practicing and playing that out and we saw so, many, so much evidence throughout the school year um, about that. This year was practical so um, how do we create and recreate the conditions every day in the classroom where that's more likely to occur than not? And one of the things that we focused on was this idea of tier one instruction, which you've heard so much about. And um, so what we did is in Merrimack, we defined tier one instruction as um, essentially content integration. That is that um, we tried to mirror the way that we're trying to create the classroom off of the way that students naturally learn. And students naturally learn by making connections between things. It's unlikely that the student is you know, exposed to 47 minutes of um, literacy and then moves to a new block of math and then cuts that part of their brain off and now starts working on math. There are natural connections and sometimes our structures don't lend themselves to making those connections or bridging those, those um, connections. And so this year, August Academy was really devoted to um, helping teachers to conceptualize how they might actually create and again recreate those conditions daily where that's the kind of instruction that just happens naturally and so we um, defined that as tier one instruction and link that by saying that in an environment like that you have established a naturally inquiry based um, environment where students might say how does that and that link? And then explore that or let the student explore that and then that becomes the foundation for our instructional approach. So, um, however, what we realize is that um, we have been really asking our teachers um, to, to dig very deep um, and to go past what's typically defined as a teacher's responsibility. And therefore, that involves a certain degree of risk and risk in the sense that um, if it looks different than the kind of instruction I've been delivering, will administration be okay with that? Will the board be okay with that? Will parents be okay if we fundamentally shift the way that we teach? Um, what if some of the things that we do don't always bear immediate fruit? Um, is that okay? Uh, am I going to get in trouble? I mean, these are real things that real professionals wonder about. And so we recognize that we need to, um, in addition to that, we need to create a culture where reasonable risk-taking is celebrated. Um, and so we were very fortunate to have um, Ty Gagney, who's the CEO of Primex uh, New Hampshire, which is a risk management um, uh, entity, to deliver a keynote 
um, where he beautifully um, provided our teachers with a language for considering um, what might be an acceptable risk in your profession and how you can reasonably assess those risks, still be safe, but still move forward and be innovative and consider the possibility of doing something different and it being okay if you do, even if the result isn't always perfect. Because as we say to students all the time, we'd rather have students try, fail, learn from the failure, pick themselves up, have stamina, and move forward than to sit within a box where they never are wrong, but they're never really that right, and their learning isn't exploding. And we want our students learning to be exploding. So we have to create a culture where that's fine for teachers too. So among the things that Ty talked about were um, assessing the headwinds. Um, you know, we all have headwinds sometimes. He's, he's a mountaineer, and so he talked to us about climbing a mountain. And sometimes you, before you climb a mountain, you have to assess what are the headwinds. I mean, what are the budget headwinds that boards face? What are the, um, the, what are the situations that federal and state uh, requirements put on us that, that cause us to have to, you know, deal with situations and maybe modify our approach? Um, talk to us about situational awareness. What is the context in the school or the classroom that allows you to make this decision versus that decision? So really giving teachers a language to think about how they're going to move forward. Once that keynote was finished, uh, teachers moved into grade level teams. So district grade two met in a room, district grade four, so on. Um, English at the high school, English department, social studies department, and then they sort of cross-pollinated and they talked about, well, if we have a safe environment and if we um, feel like we can take reasonable risk and if this is all about content integration, how can we build units? How can we build um, lessons? How can we sustain this over time by considering each other as helpers? You've heard that phrase before. And, um, and how do we assess together what's an acceptable risk and how can we move forward? And so for the afternoon of the first day, all of the second day, and the morning of the third day, um, those teams of teachers got together and um, literally laid the groundwork for creating those conditions and recreating those conditions for our students every day. And in the afternoon of August Academy, we had an opportunity to um, pull that work together um, in, a, in a neat way where each team had to define their work in three words and then creatively demonstrate uh, what that meant for them this year. And so um, the administration did it too. And um, off of that, we were able to reflect back to the teachers the words that will be our guiding principles this year. And some of the words that um, reflected our district's focus now is um, encouragement of the learner, support of the learner, um, critical thinking, analysis. And those are the conditions that we're committed to as a district to creating to make this culture more um, possible. Um, in addition to that, um, we were able to have some um, great breakout sessions for content specialists. And so our K-12 music educators got together and they had um, professional development from a gentleman named um, John Feyerabend, who is a professor of music at the Hart School of Music in, uh, at the University of Hartford. And um, his topic was conversational solfege. I have no idea what that meant, but they all did, and they were delighted about it. And basically what it means is turning, uh, teaching music as if it is a language. And so um, I only know it, it was impactful because every time I was in the room with them, they were ooing and ahhing and doing what music teachers do, which is be enthusiastic and great. And um, we also had um, a, a, a professor from uh, kinesiology from the University of Southern Mississippi named Rob Doan, who flew to us from, uh, from the South. And he was with our K-12 health and PE folks um, and um, spent uh, time with them off their curriculum work developing, uh, under, getting an even greater understanding about um, content standards in health and PE and allowed them to um, interact with the standards in a way that they might replicate for their students to make their work come alive. We had um, uh, our art educators K through 12 signed up for an online um, 
uh, workshop um, from the uh, National Association of Art Educators, and they um, had three stations in rooms, and they were able to um, have distance learning opportunities with this with this group. Um, the mental health people uh, had the opportunity to work with, uh, 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 I forget her first name, Dr. Yackley from uh, New Hampshire, um, and she worked with the um, mental health people to understand the conditions that create trauma for students in line with the work that you've heard them describe tonight and how they can better support students and help teachers to identify how to support students who have, uh, who are in an environment that induces trauma that causes them to not be effective learners. And our paraeducators um, had um, several days with uh, Carol Kuznitsky, who's done a lot of work with us before, and the para's sole focus was on um, helping to create the conditions for comprehensive tier one instruction and how to um, be supports. Um, the long gone are the days when paraeducators ran off copies for other teachers, and they are integral parts of our school community. And so their training was to get them up to speed on how our district defines tier one instruction so that they can become even more meaningful um, folks um, in the classroom. So it was a comprehensive, very exciting um, uh, day that I think bodes well for um, the way that we're really, really working hard to redefine um, you know, how we approach teaching and instruction um, in our district. And uh, it was at the Radisson in Nashua for three days, and we thank the Radisson for uh, doing beautiful work with us. Thanks. Any questions or comments from the board? Michael, are you rustling? <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, thank you, Mark. And uh, we look forward to seeing its dividends in the next 179 days. Um, so that being said, we're going to do a housekeeping announcement. Um, items 9 through 11 all require votes. Uh, because Michael is uh, joining us via phone, we're going to be doing every vote uh, via roll call. So uh, for, uh, we will go on at this point to um, agenda item number 9, which is the approval of the August 15, 2016 minutes. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Made by Naomi. Do I have a second? Seconded by Cinda. Are there any edits to the minutes? Yes, Michael? Uh, on page 5 of 13, uh, line 222, um, board member Tom Michael Thompson would like to hear from more, more from an expert such as Mike Metfield. Um, I just wanted to, instead of an exact name, I think it, it was more around looking for resources such as medical and other resources that can represent information in the field. I don't think I asked for a particular name. Then on page nine, um, line 404, um, my statement was a little broader, um, not just about uh, getting admittance to the honors program, but also to like maybe add um, or let's see here or try out honors and decide if they wanted to participate in the program in the fall. So kind of showing that it might be a trial period too, due to the uh, issue of, uh, I think it was one, one class went from 28 to 18. So that's the only two changes that I saw. Okay, are there any others? Seeing none, we will put the motion to a vote. Naomi, how do you vote? Approve. Cinda? In favor. Andy? In favor. Michael? In favor. And I vote in favor. So the motion carries 5-0-0. Zero, zero. And now we're on to item number 10, which is the acceptance of gifts and grants under $5,000 with Matt Chevenel. Thank you very much. Uh, we have three items for your consideration this evening. The first of which is from Life Touch National School Studios in the amount of $1,064. It is for Master Cola Upper Elementary School and it is to support Enterprise City. The second we have is from the 
Merrimack Lions Club, and it's for the Symbio Virtual Lab Kit. It's a physical science kit, and it's in the amount of $1,000. And lastly, we have from the MHS Striker Club to Merrimack High School, the amount of $2,300 to help pay for the soccer goals that needed replacing at the high school. So we have those three for your consideration. Do I have a motion to accept the gifts and grants listed? Cinda. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we accept the gifts and grants as delivered to us with our gratitude. Is there a second? Seconded by Andy. Um, actually, we're gonna be doing another roll call. Um, Naomi, how do you vote? In favor. Cinda. In favor. Andy. In favor. Michael. In favor. And I also vote in favor. The motion carries 5 0 0. Um, and just one note I want to make about the Striker Club. Thank you very much. Um, that's the one that we had to make cuts because of the, um, the default budget that we received. And um, we made a call out because we really did not want to lose that freshman soccer program. And the Striker Club st uh, stepped up for us. And, and uh, got us out of a bit of a pickle because we really had some great goals for that. No pun intended, but they are now. So uh, <laughs> so thank you again. Um, but that was definitely a call in need. So I wanted to uh, recognize that. Um, and now we're on to item number 11, which is the consent agenda. Mark? On consent tonight, the following teacher nominations. Um, Marion Allen, part-time oral language teacher at Merrimack Middle School. Sophia Fowler, part-time preschool teacher at Master Cola Elementary School. Aureli Humes, grade four teacher at Thornton's Ferry School. And Brianna Ledoux, school counselor at Merrimack High School. Do I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? I'm sorry, there's more, sorry. I apologize. <laughs> Me too. And, <laughs> and approval of board officers policy, sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, Andy? I move we approve the consent agenda as read. Do I have a second? Seconded by Cinda. Naomi, how do you vote? In favor. Cinda. In favor. Andy. In favor. Michael. Abstain. And I vote in favor. And we are on to item number 12, which is other. Um, first is correspondence, and we, as a board, were in receipt of a letter um, from the Consortium for School Networking uh, acknowledging that Nancy Rose has been certified a certified education uh, technology leader, a CETL. Uh, she received that designation, which required a lot of um, work. Basically, to become certified, the candidate must have demonstrated experience in the education technology field and pass a comprehensive two-part examination based on 10 skill areas in the framework of essential skills of the K-12 uh, CTO. Once the certification is earned, uh, this professional must complete 60 hours of professional development activities every three years. So it, it's a rigorous and um, high level um, national certification, which shows that um, we have talent in our ranks that will keep us on the leading edge of technology. So we uh, wanted to congratulate Nancy Rose, who's our director of, and I always have to write down because I get in the wrong order, library, media, and technology for the district. Um, not as bad as planning and building, building and planning, but it's, I always get it wrong. So, but uh, quite a bit on her plate, even in her title. So uh, congratulations to Nancy, and, uh, and we thank her for all her hard work. Um, is there any other correspondence to come before the board? Seeing none, are there any comments from the board? Seeing none, um, I, actually I will say one thing, thank you guys for all your patience. I know this has been a different environment for us. We had a lot on our plate and a lot of presentations and I think we took it in stride tonight. So, uh, so good work everyone. Um, and we will go on to number 13 which is new business. Is there any new business to come before the board? I also have one. Um, every year the board um, has the opportunity to present to administration before they start preparing their budgets guidance about the goals they see for the budget that we will be getting in the next few weeks. Um, it's going to come faster than you think. I know it's the first day of school. Um, so if you want to email me your thoughts about um, areas um, of the budget that you want to see covered um, 
as far as what you would like to see the budget to look like, everything from funding to programs, all the, all the questions that you may have about how we're going to get the job done uh, with the budget that we have to give our district. Um, send it our way. It doesn't have to be um, granular, but it can definitely be what I would call a high-level vision. Uh, based on that, I will take all of your feedback, compile it, and give what I would call a consistent vision of the board um, that we will share at our October 2nd meeting. Um, to do that effectively, my goal would be to have your emails on the 19th. And then I will uh, spend the next couple of weeks reaching out to you, making sure I have your points uh, well taken, and we'll give it to the board as a com one comprehensive unit. So that is the new business. So your assignment for the 19th is send me your notes and your thoughts. If you have questions, absolutely send them my way as well. And from there, we will get, we want to make sure that the administration has their, their message from us by October 3rd. Um, so seeing no other business, let's go on to number 14, which is committee reports. Are there any committee reports? See Andy. So one committee report. Um, Suresk met on August 25th. Um, probably the biggest highlight is that it was the first meeting run by Mark Conrad, who's the new executive director. Is that what his title? Executive right. director of Suresk. Um, so there was a lot of sort of ground setting to, to you know to, for what his philosophy is and how he's going to run things forward. And we talked about several items, uh, including things like budget and uh, programs around uh, what Suresk is thinking about offering. Um, and the meet one comment is the meetings are going to be. It used to be like twice a year or something, maybe three times, three to four, sometimes less, sometimes more. Um, now they're, what they're going to do is they're going to happen monthly for a while to try to go through some, some of the things we're talking about at the board of directors level and then expand out into maybe a longer period. But for the next six months, they're going to be pretty regular on a monthly basis. I think we skip one month around the holidays, but uh, but it's going to be pretty regular for a while as we transition to Mark and the way he's doing things. So. Um, and the other committee report is just a heads up that next Monday, um, I believe that the, at least Matt and, and Marge is coming in front of the Planning and Building Committee to share, drum roll please, the CIP items for the budget thing. So I will have a, I'll be the canary in the coal mine to find what the, the CIP changes are. Hopefully we don't have another middle school roof and uh, um, other things of that magnitude this time, but I'll act surprised when I see what it is. So. But we know we're not going to have the middle school roof because it all got done. Well, exactly. <laughs> Good stuff. So um, are there any other committee reports? Cinda. <clears throat> um, I had a safeguard meeting that I attended last week. Um, there was a really interesting presentation by the Good Grief program through Home Health and Hospice. It was a presentation about how they help youth and families make positive choices. Um, from there, there was, uh, I guess one other thing to note is the DEA Take Back Day is October 22nd, and that is a Saturday from 10 to 2 at the police station, a place to get rid of unwanted prescription medication and whatnot. And what? And over the counter. And over the counter. And that's it. Excellent. And I have one. Uh, the Greater Woods Subcommittee met on the 16th, and we are uh, planning on having a work weekend this weekend to spruce up the trails. And we will be working on. Um, there's some trails that we are using um, for cross country that we uh, may want to look at. You know, assisting with some mowing because um, it's on our property. But, uh, and some of it goes just over the border, so we'll talk about that. But, uh, you know, long term, we just want to get the, the uh, trails cleaned up while it's nice and dry and easy to work with. So some goals are, um, I don't know, if, for those who aren't aware, Greater Woods is about 500 acres now. It's probably closer to seven. Um, they picked up some new properties. So there's a lot of more uh, trails that came with the property when it was purchased. And um, it's going to create for a bigger um, roadmap, I guess you would say even in the woods um, for, for possibilities for Merrimack residents and, of course, students alike, because there's lots to learn out there for our students. Um, and it feeds right into the middle school. So um, we will be working on that this weekend. Um, and that's all I had. So if there are no other committee, you do. He, he wrestled. Hold on. Um, there you go. You got it? 
uh, we had the Parks and Rec meeting, um, and uh, Chief Doyle came in to kind of discuss the resident, non-resident restrictions at Wasburn Park. Um, on top of that, uh, the good news is that the dog park is a go. Um, some of the things that I think is very relevant for um, the children within Merrimack is that the camp was actually sold out for seven of eight sessions this year, with only the 4th of July week being the one that wasn't sold out. The theater camp was a great hit. Uh, the preschool camp uh, had about 30 children. Um, something that is coming up is the 9-11 Memorial or Remembrance Ceremony at 7 p.m. at Abbey Griffin Park. Um, but the one thing that I took out of that meeting was I was just amazed by how much Matt does for this community um, with such limited resources of individuals that are uh, paid by uh, the community and uh, there's a lot of volunteers that make a lot of things go for the Parks and Rec on top of it. So that's just it. Fantastic. Um, so I think we're out of committee reports. So we're on to item number 15 which is public comments on agenda items. Big moment here. There's two people. And no one's moving. So we are going to close public comments on agenda items, take a moment to sign the manifest, and I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Made by Andy. Do I have a second? Seconded by Naomi. All those in favor? Uh, oh, we have to roll call for closing, too. Gosh darn it. Okay, we were so close. Naomi, how do you vote? In favor. Cinda? In favor. Andy? Yo. <laughs> Michael? In favor. And I also vote in favor. We are adjourned. Thank you and good night.